DD79, we're ready to go for our joint department heads meeting. Um, we're going, I'm sure that there's a, many people in this room who are super happy that we're going in reverse order today. So we will start with Mr. Cameron from TV79. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just a couple of highlights from the report, which I think speaks for itself in terms of the strong viewership that we're continuing. Uh, the technology in the room here is supposed to be finally wired and ready to go later today. This is a project that's been running since yeah. March. Um, long story as to why it's taken so long, but I apologize for that. But um, both of these monitors should be working uh, later today. We will see how that works out. Um, proud to announce that uh, we did a wonderful project with Norwalk Community College's video students producing some bumpers, some promos for TV79. Those are running on the air now. And well, this is all I, well, the new website is up and running. I hope you've had a chance to take a look at that. It's uh, offering some better functionality in terms of being able to search through all of the Vimeo programs so you don't have to look through them chronologically. You can search them by committee, etc. Happy to answer any questions. Oh, Sarah, go ahead. I didn't have any questions. I just wanted to sit. I love the contest. I think that's phenomenal. I don't know if you've done that before, but I think that's a wonderful idea. So I'm glad. Thank this you. is our first time, as a matter of yeah, fact. Okay. And one of the, one of the uh, students is doing the shoot today. Okay. Sam is in the booth working with us. NCC does a very good job. Uh, this was a, an idea I had when I reached out to them over the summer. They were more than happy to cooperate. and. Uh, the nice thing was it, it got the students to come down to Darien, look at this town with a fresh set of eyes, uh, highlight what they thought were the most exciting things in town, and the results were, you know, really impressive. I thought they did a very nice job. Thank you. Okay. Um, a little plug for you, Jim. Uh, if you don't know about it, I encourage all of you to find the podcast called Now We're Talking Darien. <coughs> with our own Jim Cameron, who was <coughs> featured on a recent podcast issue. You'll learn all sorts of interesting stuff about Jim and his background. It's very, very well I think done. they're running out of guests. They <laughs> came down to me <laughs> as finally as well, too. Uh, one other thing I'll, I'll mention, uh, it's not in this particular quarter, but the Darien League of Women Voters uh, Candidates Night, which was held in the auditorium uh, to a very limited audience, uh, has almost had 600 views on our Vimeo channel, which says to me the people are looking at uh, the candidates side by side, talking about the issues, et cetera. So uh, we're very proud that that worked out well. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Jim? David? Uh, Jim, would you just elaborate on the searchability function uh, that, that yeah. the Darien Sprites are being put in uh, place? Can yeah. Will the residents be able to search by topic? You mentioned by, by you know, department or by commission. Would they say if, if they're interested in a specific issue, will they be able to search for that issue to find out where it's discussed in any meeting? They're going to have to know which committee might have had jurisdiction over that. So if you were looking at uh, the 7-Eleven application up at Dutchess, for example, right. uh, you'd be able to find all the P&Z meetings, and you'd be able to look at the agendas of those meetings and then find specific time references to okay. where in that meeting that topic was discussed. Yeah, the, the time references are exceptionally helpful right. when you're looking for a specific topic. Yep. I just wanted to make sure that you still had to uh, go through all the agendas. No, you don't have to go through them all. Just well, click on each one. Well, for the department you're interested in. Right, for the department you're interested in, yeah. Do, do you Monica. have results for these? Uh, we are going to, um, yes, we do. We will have remotes for these. And the idea of these is that they will be uh, both capable of showing uh, go-to-meeting hybrid if we were doing that. Uh, each one would be independent. So for example, if P&Z was meeting in here and there was a presentation being made with PowerPoint, that could be shown on this monitor behind me here while the go-to-meeting continued as well too. So uh, they'll both be tied together, either simulcasting or doing separate uh, feeds as well, too. Great. Yeah. One last question. So the timestamps, those are up to the committees, right? The timestamps are up to the committees. And uh, P&Z and Board of Finance does a very good job of 
as the meeting is occurring, uh, writing on their own agenda when a particular issue on that agenda came up in the meeting. Uh, there are timestamps also on the uh, League of Women Voters uh, candidates night, so you can go directly to see the for selectman candidates, Board of Education candidates, selectman candidates as well too. Any other questions for Jim? Okay. Thank I'd you just so like much. to add a personal note, thank <clears throat> all of you for your service. I know this is going to be one of the, not the last, but one of the last uh, Board of Selectmen meetings and I want to thank you all for your service to the town. Thanks Jim. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, Alicia, Youth Commission. Good morning. Good morning. A little, um, I know that we're on the cusp of um, a big turnaround here with the Board of Selectmen. A little um, gift for Kate, yours is up there. Um, Darien Youth Commission masks that we provided all the staff this summer as masks were required for all individuals for participating in our summer camp program regardless of vaccination status while indoors, including campers, and none were required when we were outdoors. Thank you. Um, a couple of uh, um, things that I'd like to point out. I thought that you saw, I hope that you saw the coverage in the Darien Times of the Yellow Tulip Project. Um, there were close to, there were probably about 800 tulips, yellow tulips that were planted um, a week ago this past Saturday. Um, almost, a fat, uh, almost 500 here in the town hall, thanks to Alan Hyatt Landscaping for prepping the land for us. Um, if they hadn't done it, we would probably still be out there digging holes and we also planned it at the library. And then um, additionally, um, tomorrow night, the Thriving Youth Task Force will be hosting a community forum at Middlesex Middle School at seven o'clock in the evening. And it is the results of the student survey, mental health and substance abuse trends. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, and, and a public shout out to Kip for letting us um, host our third drive through food drive at Coons Lot across the street from Tilly Pond Park next Saturday, October 30th, uh, partnering with Person to Person again. That's from nine to noon. <coughs> Great. And I echo Jim Cameron's sentiments. Thank you very much, particularly you, Jamie. It's just been a pleasure working so closely with you. Likewise, thank you. Thanks. Keep it going. <coughs> Great, thanks so much. Okay, Town Treasurer Joan. <coughs> Good morning. I have um, not much to add to my report um, except that I have September numbers. Um, in the general fund, we earn $28,097.44 in the total town. We, earn 30, uh, we have 30538 and 49 cents. Um, not exciting numbers, but when rates are zero, it's hard to, hard to um, earn money. So um, we're doing okay, and you have the portfolio as of August in the back. Um, any questions? John, so I see treasuries in the What's the lag time you um, find? Okay, that's a little complicated for us um, because we can't do treasuries and that's because of, um, I would love to do them, um, but Wayne Fox has um, not approved the documentation for any treasuries and his rationale is because it is um, governed by SIPIC, which is, again, you probably know from your old days, it's a securities law um, based probably in New York. He wants us under banking law based in Connecticut where, um, he, he uh, knows it better, but we're opening a door. I, you know, I don't agree. Um, I know a lot of people don't agree, but he's our lawyer and we have to do what he says. So um, it's hard to even track a relationship these days because so much is artificial depending on the institution you're investing with. Like we would probably do our treasuries through a bank if we could do them. Um, but again, every, Everybody's rates are different and um, based on their, um, you know, their needs. One of the things that, again, that where we have made money, and just as an aside to this, is, you know, as a former banker, what you have a lot of times is your treasury department in a bank funding area will go in and sweep and lower rates to window dress um, the bank, 
And I've seen, I've seen a couple instances where suddenly our rates have dropped and I call up our bank and say, uh-uh. I said, I know what's going on. And they'll say, well, it wasn't me, you know, it was our treasurer. I said, then you go back and make an exception for us. And they all have. Um, so that's, again, it's all intertwined, but it's really individual. Any other questions? John, I have a big picture question since okay. this is my last department heads meeting. <clears throat> Um, in, in an endeavor to make sure that you as town treasurer feel supported in your work doing investments for the town, would you ever consider having a small committee, an in, a town investment committee that would be made up of, you know, someone from the Board of Finance, you know, and a couple other people to just support the work that you do, talk about town policies and interface with legal counsel on, on an important matter? like the one you just raised? Um, I actually ran on that <laughs> 16 years ago, saying I would like people who have expertise um, to be able to advise me. Um, and as I said, that was one of the original things I ran on. I do, I have de facto used the Board of Finance um, for that purpose, particularly like um, people who are actively trading. You know, uh, one of the ways we've made money is I look for anomalies. And those people are in the markets every day. And like I had one where I thought I saw something um, on repos where I thought, oh, OK, maybe they're going to seize and I can make a little money. And I actually called the state, um, um, one of the investment advisors, who's very good at stuff. He's excellent. And then I called Jim Palin, who's mm -hmm. you know a trader. Um, so yes, yeah, de facto, I'm doing But I, I wholeheartedly agree. Where I would make the distinction is um, people who want to force me into a decision. It's been very interesting as rates are at zero. I've gotten lots less comments of people who think they know my job better because they really don't have any ideas at all. So it's been, that part's been kind of fun. It's like, oh, okay. Um, but yes, I okay. de facto do it. But I would love to do it. It's, Thank you. I, I ran on that. A every organization that I've been involved with in my tenure as first selectman has an investment committee. So I strongly encourage the Board of Selectmen going forward to work with you to convene, maybe it's a subcommittee of the Board of Finance and yourself. So just an that idea. That would be fine with me. Great. So, and thank you for your service You're and welcome. thank you for your meeting, last meeting. Okay, thanks. Okay, town clerk. There she is. Good morning. Hi, Krista. I am honored and thrilled to be here to report to you regarding the workings of the town clerk's office. Uh, we are busy downstairs. Uh, as you probably know, the town clerk's office handles the absentee ballot process for the election season, whereas the registrar of voters handles the poll ballots. We are over 700 applications currently being processed. As a comparison, we did 154 two years ago. For the presidential election, we did 6,000. So we're really seeing a migration to absentee ballot as the way people are choosing to vote, um, most of whom are choosing COVID as a reason, but uh, it seems to be a direction in which voting will be going going forward. Um, in addition to, and it's a very manual process also, putting together ballots, processing applications, putting the information into the state website. So, um, but we are making sure we are getting all the applications out within 48 hours, which we are required to do so by state statute. Uh, in addition to absentee ballots, we continue to process marriage licenses. We are getting a young bride in as quickly as we can before the baby comes. So we want to work with everybody to make sure that we are a full service organization. Um, and land records, we stay very busy with all the developments. Clearly, they're going on in town with Corbin District and Federated. They will all file their land records with us also. So you have my report, and I'm here to answer any questions. Yes. Um, uh, for, for the benefit of any uh, residents, if somebody at this late date want to get an absentee ballot, when is the last time that that, that it's practical to actually try to? But when is the last time they can they can submit an application for a ballot? That's the right question. Good question. That's a good question, um, but I'm going to really approach it from the other direction. We need to have their completed ballot by 8 p.m. on November 2nd. Got it. So it really is a factor as to where are we sending that ballot, where do they live, are they doing it in person, we have, an, we have one application where the ballot's going to Japan. So any elector needs to be cognizant 
that that ballot needs to be back into town hall by November 2nd, 8 p.m. It that, also, so it, it depends where the absentee person is. And correct. For how far away it has yeah. to go. It depends the, upon the circumstances of where that elector is. Perfect. That So I approach it from the other direction. We need it by 8 p.m. We have the drop box, which is open for the benefit of the public. Drop box is open. They can drop it off. Um, you can still come in and fill out an absentee ballot application and get your ballot same day. It's also very important to understand the, uh, you, you can't rely on the United Parcel Service for timely delivery of your ballot. So the sooner the better, right? Correct. The ballot box is open 24-7 you know, to be dropped off if your application or your ballot. Yeah. Chris, a small question, but sure. on the vital records fee, is that a, just a break even when you charge the uh, processing fee? Um, no, those just rates are set by the state, <laughs> and we do, some money comes to us and the other money, the conveyance goes to the state. So it's a, a formula breakdown. Any other questions for Krista? No, thank you. Great, thanks okay, so much. Great, thanks so yeah. much. Thank you. Okay, Kathy Larkins, tax collector. Good morning. Um, so just a few highlights. Um, the collection rate uh, this year versus last year at this time is running ahead, and that also factors in. Um, there's no issue with the deferments that were done last year. Um, I ran the numbers yesterday just to see and I'm about half a percentage point ahead, which was consistent with what this report says. Um, um, on a downside, the pro rate billings are about 50,000 under what was budgeted. Um, I had a conversation with Tony Helmicki about that and the reason is that more of the construction was the increased value when the construction was included in the July bills, therefore we didn't have a need to do a separate pro rate billing after the July bills were issued. So we, we should overall be fine, but just the way we break it out, it will look like I'm under budget on that particular um, number. Um, in terms of the sewer service billing, um, we do that starting October 1st. It was a $4.2 million billing. Um, the number of liens we had to file for unpaid 2020 sewer billings was about 40 properties less than the prior year, which is excellent. Some of that may be with all the conveyances going on, you know, anything that was in arrears is getting paid um, as part of the reporting process. Um, and then um, the tax office also gets involved with um, the parking authority regarding uh, the issuance of commuter parking permits. Anyone that has outstanding taxes cannot get their permit renewed. Um, so an updated number is, as of yesterday, we had nine permit holders and about just under $4,500 worth of delinquent taxes that were still unpaid. Um, therefore, those nine permit, permit holders will not receive their applications. But, you know, we started off at 53 uh, permit holders and 18,000. So this definitely does help get some of those accounts paid. Um, so I don't know if you have any questions. Yes. Just out of curiosity, if I go back to as far as 2008, mm -hmm. what was the lowest collection rate that the town has seen? I would have to get back to you on that. Okay. I, it would definitely be 99 point something, probably 99.2 or 3, somewhere in that ballpark. That's what I, that's what I was referring to. I think that that's one of the things that we have been uh, incredibly conservative with in the budget process overall, um, uh, because the collection rate has turned out to be more stable than people might have expected uh, during times of emergency. I would agree that the budgeted collection rate was extremely conservative up until about two or three years ago when the Board of Finance did a whole, they factor in what my current rates have been over I believe the last five years and they do some kind of a, an average and um, Jen would be able to speak to that when she um, has they, her they, report. They do the average of the past five years minus 25 basis points. Right. 25 basis points on the current uh, uh, assessed value in town is about $388,000. So the <coughs> deduction of the 25 basis points uh, from the average uh, collection rate uh, basically builds nearly $400,000 worth of safety into the budget every year. Okay. It used to be more than that. It used to be about $2 million. 
Um, so when they went to this new formula, it definitely did tighten it up. And you know, we are going into questionable economic times. Don't know what's gonna happen over the next couple of years. So I do think it's important to leave a little bit of a buffer in case, you know, I do work really hard to maintain it as high a collection rate as possible. But, you know, there needs to be a little bit of conservatism when that budgeted rate is set. Okay. In my opinion. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah, Kathy, I want to thank you. Um, you've done a really fantastic job over your tenure you. in going after back taxes. You know, taxes do um, excellent work on behalf of the town. I try to do it in a very friendly manner. Yeah. And some of the most delinquent people happen to be like, um, how do I want to say that? I don't want to say friends, but we are on a very positive, friendly note. So Very nice. And I want to thank all of you. Uh, Jamie and Kip, you know, working, serving under you has been a privilege and an honor. Monica and Sarah, I wish you good luck in the upcoming election. Thank you. And David, I really look forward to working with you on the Board of Finance. Right, thank so you. thank you very much. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Beth Paris, Senior Center. We are enjoying a lot of uh, participation and it continues to increase, so that's been wonderful. Uh, and people have still been so compliant with the distancing, the masking. Uh, every now and then we get a little crabbiness, but for the most part everybody is really compliant because they want to be in the building. So we are continuing to add more programs uh, and services. We're maintaining our drive through lunch probably until early spring. We're hoping to bring everything back in the building and get some good news. Um, when uh, the, the younger generations are vaccinated, I think it's going to make us all um, ready to roll the way that we were prior, I hope. Um, we are the waivers. People are very uh, complicit in, in helping us uh, sign those waivers. And we're over 365 different people now have signed a waiver, which means 365 people different have been in the building. So that's, that's an increased number of almost 120 from the last time I made this report because we just counted them all up again yesterday. Um, I did add what we were going to do in the next quarter, so you can see um, we're going to be very active and we're trying to keep people not only entertained, uh, but also to you know re regain that quality of life and connecting with each other, which is so very, very important. So. Beth, can you tell us how the, the things that you're doing in this pandemic environment, how they might compare to other town senior programs? Well, we were, I was just chosen to be on the working group for the state by uh, Senator Bob Duff. Um, and Terry Wood, I'm going to use her, her words, she said it's because Darian is the gold standard. Mm -hmm. So um, very proud and honored and privileged to be on that committee. It's going to be an 18-month working group. We basically have brought more programming back uh, than our 14 town folks have uh, and had very much more vigorous attendance. So, because um, we're in touch with each other, we all talk to one another. I think part of it is the, the, big, the safety issue here, how well Darian has done with the vaccination and keeping people safe. Um, and I think that it also is that we've, oh, we always had vigorous attendance prior. So people were really happy to come back in. But the addition of the Zooming, which we're gonna be doing more over the winter that, that I added, um, we've gotten people hooked up into a different kind of participation. And many of the people are over 85 that are now doing this as well. So we're trying to bring in a class now to teach those that don't know how to do it because it's a wonderful, useful tool as well. And not that something else is gonna, another shoe is gonna drop, but just in case, we'll already be well versed on that. And that's helped a lot of people. We're also working on um, looking at how we can live stream uh, some of the classes that we have in center um, so that people don't miss out on something that they can possibly come in for. It also helped us identify folks that want to be interacting with their community but really are not able to get out as frequently or freely as they might be, as some other folks might. So it's helped us a great deal to expand what we're doing. Also on the caregiver level, I've done more caregiver support and information sessions and even one-to-ones. 
um, since the pandemic began. That's part of my, my background is I worked for the Alzheimer's Association as a volunteer caregiver support group leader for many years. I think it's over 20 now. So um, that has really, really blossomed into a regular complement of people now knowing to call. And even if their, their mom or dad isn't here, they'll call even for their mom and dad that's out of state so that they know what to ask and how to help that person and how to access information from the states that they might live in too. So that's another expansion that happened over this kind of 18 month period. A couple of things. First of all, congratulations on being appointed to the state working group. Thank you. Um, really happy about that. And oh my goodness, how far we've come in the last 12 years from the from, senior center. Well, from my program. heart to your heart, yeah. I will wow. tell you 12 years I've been yeah. here, 12 years Incredible. you've been, 10 years you've been, and, and I just have to tell you that the support and encouragement um, that you've lent us has made us what we are today. So well, I carry that with you. Our seniors are so well served in this community. I'm, I'm very glad to know that we're considered to be the gold standard. We certainly consider us to be. Live streaming of programming sounds fantastic. Will you look to work with um, TV79 and or the Darien Community Foundation? Both. Both. I Great. De definitely, Jim, I have to sit down okay. with, he's going to have to tootle us on, uh, yeah. and I do know that there's a YouTube channel too that some oh. folks uh, can put their, their information and their programming on as well. We just have to work on the getting the permission of the instructors or yeah. the doctors or, because we have wonderful health and wellness programs and we just have to have everybody's permission that they say okay for us to do it. Yeah. If you need technology, um, sounds right in the wheelhouse of the Darien Community Foundation yes. for a grant potentially. We have good friends there too. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Other questions for Beth? Right now, what we're doing is, uh, and this is how we're testing it out, on the Fridays that we're having the outside entertainments, when it's not really good weather, we've brought folks in, we've socially distanced them in seats facing the stage, and but the lunch is also a geared to lunch that they can have in their lap. They take their mask off to eat it, they put the mask back on, we throw the trash out and they stay in their places and the performer can obviously be unmasked because he's more than 12 feet away from them. That's worked out. So it's a way of us starting to figure out how we're going to bring things back in. Super. So. Great. Any other questions for Thank Beth? You. No. Thank you so much. All right. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Registrars, John and Susan. It's busy season for you guys. All right. Do you want to Oh, okay. <laughs> I can't talk about that. Oh, I can take mine off. Um, Su Susan and I are knee deep in uh, election preparation. Um, it's always kind of exciting. Um, except this year, uh, Kathy Zeiss is retiring mm -hmm. after 17 years, which is very hard for us to replace her. She just knows everything, and we don't have to worry about it. So Susan's been interviewing. Uh, our printer broke. Uh, we had ballots that had to be reprinted. Uh, poll workers have always been a problem, but we're getting through it, right? Yeah. I think we're in we're in the final stretch. Yeah. So um, it keeps us busy, um, but we have a good program, and I think uh, we're able to adjust to all the problems that come up. Um, even poll workers, we're going to be training this this week on on that. We have to. Uh, because the ballots had to be reprinted, um, we're kind of behind in the testing, but we'll get that done. Well, the ballots had to be reprinted because someone was named, I think it was Carolyn Bain, yeah. was named to a commission, the EPC commission, and we had already put her name on the ballot. So they had to be reprinted, and I think the memory cards had to be yeah, reprogrammed. We, so it was a little glitch, but it was unforeseen. We had to, we had to correct it before the election. So. Uh, you're familiar with our testing down in the basement, yep. so we usually have it done by now. We're we're doing it this week, and um, we're a little behind. <laughs> we're a little behind, but we're okay. Yeah. We'll What's the cost done. for reprinting ballots? Roughly? Um, we're, what do you think it'll be? Maybe well, it, we reprinted uh, District Six, so it isn't. It's too not. It's not okay. horrible. Yeah, it's, it's not horrible. Maybe uh, several hundred. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, it's, this year what I'm trying to do is get the expenses in on purchase orders prior to the election, but it's always hard to figure out the exact amount. Um, and that brings up another thing. I really appreciate the board approving all the contingency money to pay for the overages. When uh, We've had, what, four, four, elections. four elections. We usually budget for one, so that's been quite a challenge. Um, to keep those expenses straight, but we're we're getting we're getting there. We're taking care of everything. So thank you, all of you. Yeah, for being thank so you, supporter Jamie. Thank you for all of your support for the almost five years that I've been here. Um, you know, we've had some we've had some stuff going on. The presidential election was always insane, but we've gotten through it, and um, I think the town has done very well with the absentee ballot voting. Mm -hmm. It was really smooth. Um, yeah. Well, it was difficult last year with Karen Diller's sudden passing, but we all pitched in. The registrars and the town hall, or the town clerk's office, all worked together, and um, and I think we, you know, had a smooth transition um, with Krista. So. Um, and just to address absentee ballots, um, <laughs> we have an extra day to count those absentee ballots that come in late. Uh, on election day, so we have a whole crew that comes in the day after, and we're able to count those ballots. So everything gets counted. No, no, I, I, I knew everything got counted. My yeah. concern was if somebody still wanted to get an absentee ballot, how does it work? And Krista had talked me something yeah. because I hadn't really focused on how far away the person is, and yeah, the mail these days seems to be less reliable. So uh, that's uh, that's pretty important. If, if there were people in town who were commuters. You know, taking the train every day and just can't make it to the right. physically, they still have time to get a ballot. If they oh, want. absolutely. Right. Yeah. That's 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 kind of what I was asking about. Uh, about yeah, I, I had mentioned that Krista, it would be interesting to see how many ballots, when they count absentee ballots like mail in, but the box, I think the majority of the ballots come back through the box right out in front of the town oh, hall. Yeah. Because people still have a little hesitancy about the mail, but they like dropping off their ballot and their you know applications right out here. So well I'm sure we all feel the same way. Right? Thank you guys because you guys are the the critical link in democracy in our town. Well without without, without uh, fair and accurate voting we don't have democracy. So thank you. Hmm. Now, we never thought our little office would be the, the focus of the of the nation, you know, the whole electoral process and voting rights. Um, it's, it's been pretty exciting. Um, I wanted to say we're still um, putting our safeguards, our poll safety plan that we have filed with the Secretary of State through the whole pandemic is in, is in full force again. We've revised it for this election and we've sent a huge packet of training materials to our poll workers. Um, we've gotten approval by the Secretary of State not to train every single poll worker in person because uh, we have um, last yeah. last election, a lot of our poll worker force is elderly, and they were a little nervous. They couldn't hear us through our masks. Um, Rick, the head of safe, regional safety manager, um, has been working with us, and we have to maintain all the social distancing and the mask requirements and everything. And they had a hard time hearing the details of the training. So. Um, we sent people who are seasoned in their positions were sent all their training materials, and if they have any questions, we'll train them in person. But we'll do it individually or in small groups rather than in big, big groups. Um, and we're using all of our poll site training. We've got extra poll workers cleaning all the poll booths, and um, we're happy to say that through the four elections, we don't know of any case that stemmed from one of our elections. Um, we have some safeguards in place for voters who come in without masks. We're going to set up special voting booths and have the moderators of the assistant registrars usher them over to that area and get them through the line more quickly and out of the building more quickly. Under Connecticut law, we cannot ask a voter who is not in a mask to leave the poll site. They have a right to vote maskless. So um, we're continuing all the things that we've done. Even though we're vaccinated, um, we still have, we're still in the middle of the Delta pandemic, and even though our rates are fantastic in Connecticut of vaccination, um, we're still using the same oh, yeah. safety measures that we did in the first election during the height of COVID. I think Monica has.
has a question. I have, I have two questions. One on the mask. Is it possible to offer people when they're coming in a mask in case they didn't realize that it's required? Yeah, we have masks. We've had it for the last two years. We even asked yeah. them, would you like to wear a mask? We have plenty of them. Um, Nick has restocked us. And, uh, oh, it's Nick? Nick, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and um, yes, definitely. You know, we give them that choice. We have them available, so. We're also implementing, we're going to train our, our moderators or the heads of the poll site, and we're happy we are definitely training all of our moderators in person and our brand new assistant registrars um, later this week. And we will tell them that if in because of the pandemic, if a voter wants to vote curbside, um, we're going to instruct them how to do it under the statute. There are some ways that they have to do it. And, um, uh, so we'll we'll do that this week. Um, you know, there's some special mechanisms in place because of the pandemic. Okay, my second question is on District Six. Yeah. I was thinking that some ballots probably have already gone out that you haven't reprint, you haven't printed. You printed yeah, we, new ones, right? But yeah, we already. reprinted the poll ballots. Right. Yes. Um, Good question. Okay. But the absentee ballots had already gone out, so okay. I I don't think it'll be a huge problem. Um, because both ballots, absentee and poll ballots, uh, if there's any issue on the ballot, we do a hand count. Okay. And we try to determine the intent of the voter. So that's still mm -hmm. available and we can still count count it that way, so. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Sarah? Switching gears slightly, um, the redistricting plan for the state, you said that um, current local and state voting district lines might change. Will that affect our local voting districts within the town of Darien, the six districts? Yeah, that'll be up to the RTM uh, okay. if they want them to change to okay. kind of conform to state voting boundaries. Okay. Uh, we could, Susan and I could certainly take direction from them and implement those changes. Okay. But um, we're kind of like wait and see uh, what the boundaries are going to be first. That might streamline a little bit. Um, In 2012, there were, there were some changes in the state voting district lines and we did the RTM did implement the changes okay um, I, I don't I'm not sure I, w I wasn't here and I'm not sure how that changed the voting district boundaries but Darien has a um, has a practice of balancing their voting their local voting districts so I would think that if and the RTM it's, it's for purposes of RTM equal representation so I would think that if the state boundary lines did were altered, we might yeah, have to we change. might we, yeah. we might want to not have to because that's our practice. Mm -hmm. We might want to change some of the local voting district boundary lines, but yeah. I don't think that it would. I, it, yeah, we're kind of like wait and see what the state lines are going to be. Um, I look forward to hearing more. Yeah, Thank is you. that yeah. a consolidation opportunity? We've talked about that many times over the years. Yeah, we Susan and I worked on the three district plan. That's still available. Okay. I think a lot of what we put into it, it still applies. Uh, it's something to look at maybe yeah. after. It would be a great time lines. to do it because yes. yeah, because they under the statute, I think they like us mm -hmm. to balance. Um, our districts in a census year or following a census year. Okay. Um, so the we have not heard about any state plan that has been implemented yet. No, or, not yet. So um, I encourage you to come back to the Board of Selectmen and have a conversation with the Board of Selectmen mm -hmm. um, uh, and talk about the options when the time comes. For a small town, we're really split yeah. a lot of different ways. It's it's. It makes our job a little bit more complicated when, especially printing ballots, because there's so many different. Each district has a different ballot, and um, and we have some districts that are split, as you know, <coughs> um, some congressional districts. So if we could, con if we could consolidate those districts and make them one congressional representative. Representative, that would be great. Yeah, and if that happens, then there is an opportunity, definitely, to go look at the local districts, absolutely. Right. Good. And we'll work with planning and zoning and on the maps. Um, there are some registrars in Connecticut, um, in Fairfield, who have who helped us in 2012, who are still available to help with helping us do our numbers and our redistricting. But we will do it all under the purview of the RTM. And thank you for all your help. Yeah. Really, it's been appreciated. I've been here about the same time Jamie has been here and uh, we've come a long way as far as when I took over with uh, Kathy Hamill and 
of course now Susan, it's, it's really changed a lot. We have a good program. Yeah, We're you guys do a handle. great job. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay. all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to Group B. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. All right. Take care. Chief, so you're this number is one. The only person here from Group B. It must be me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, big group. We I have think. the floor. I guess I top billing. Well, uh, as usual, uh, my staff I think generated a comprehensive quarterly report. Any errors or omissions are on me. Anything that you like in that report, duly noted to my staff that helps me prepare that. So they do a really good job at it. A couple things I would like to highlight. One is the OPM grant that we got for the Lower Fairfield County Motor Vehicle Task Force. This continues to be problematic across the state and the region. Uh, OPM got some federal money to give us to try to address this. We are actively doing it with both proactive high visibility patrols and some other things behind the scenes that we're doing as well to try to meet this best we can. Uh, I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. Uh, again, as I've said time and time again, in every public meeting, please lock your car. It cons consistently continues to be the cars are unlocked with the fobs in them and they're being recovered across the state and the region. So we'll ask once again to please lock your cars. The other thing I'd like to highlight in the report, because uh, I know we talked about this in the board select meeting once before, is the, um, the activation devices for our body cameras. Again, transparency, very important to both the Darien Police Department and police across the state and the region. Single sidearm is now what we have on our holsters for our firearms. So when you, now we have a myriad of ways to activate the body camera, right? The officer can activate it himself, body camera and the dash camera automatically goes on when you put on your emergency lights. It automatically uh, goes on when you exceed 70 miles an hour. And now it also goes on when you pull your taser out or you pull your firearm out. So there's five. We're trying to make this as automated as possible to ensure we have the video that we are supposed to have and that the public expects us to have uh, in this day and age. So just we have every option covered here as far as physically possible for our body cameras to be activated when they're supposed to be for full transparency and accountability and to show an accurate representation of what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Other than that, I will take questions. I'm sure there are some questions. Yep. Policing Chief. is still yep. in flux. Thank you very much. I'm really excited about the signal sidearm. Can you tell me if uh, we're one of the first in the state to adopt that technology? I believe we were, and when we got it the first time, as we found out, it didn't work with our holsters, and our holsters are pretty standard national issue holsters, level three holsters. Uh, we worked with Taser Axon to, um, they tweaked their uh, mounting assemblies, so field tested it, found that it worked, so I, yes, I believe we were the first department in the state to have that implementation of that technology. Congratulations. That's really fantastic and deserves some public attention. It's one of those technologies we hope we don't have to use, yep. of course, but if, it, if it's called for that we have it without having to actually manually activate your camera under times of stress. Yep. Um, just one thing on your report under the types of incidents chart. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to um, show same quarter last year comparison on that chart? We can, do, we can add that. Thank you. I can tell you that for sexual assault and robbery, I believe in comparison there were none in the previous quarter, to my, to my knowledge. Okay. Uh, we can certainly do that at quarter up on quarter. Domestic violence, probably pretty consistent from quarter to quarter. Yeah. There's been an uptick in pandemic times. Luckily, we haven't had any that were major, involving major injury, but we do still see an uptick in domestic cases. Yeah. I'm talking about Q3 to Q3. Correct. Right. Oh, okay. year to year? Year to year. Over year, okay. year over year. 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 Yeah, because mm -hmm. we can go back to last quarter, so okay. look at that. Questions for the chief? Monica. Quick question. Can you give us an update on that same slide before you start? Yeah, we're, we're working pretty closely with a local group here in Darien. We have emails going back and forth on final designs on bumper stickers and other uh, banners. That's kind of the... Police commissions working on that. Hopefully, we can roll it out fairly quickly. My understanding was supposed to be rolled out by now. 
we're a little bit behind on that, but it is it is coming. Um, I think it's a good initiative to try to get folks just to really think for a minute or two. Uh, we did have a pedestrian accident last week on the Roten Avenue and Ledge Road, and it's one of these where someone was trying to cross in the crosswalk with the light, and someone was trying to make a right turn on red from Ledge Road onto Neroten was watching traffic coming up the Roten Avenue, as you must do there, and didn't see the pedestrian in the crosswalk. Those kind of things that we're really trying to get people to take an extra second to make sure that they are seeing what they think they're seeing before they were seeing intersections. Distracted driving is something that is just not going to go away with the plethora of electronics and diversions that we have when driving. I see it every day when I drive home on my commute see dozens or more folks on the highway that are actively uh, disengaged with actually driving. So it remains to be problematic. So this will roll out no matter when, whenever it's done, it'll roll out. It doesn't matter what season, right? Correct. Okay. I, I, think, I think we're very close to rolling it out. Sarah will give us an update on that too during our Board of Select meeting. Okay. David? I want to thank you for the advertising. I saw the police asking to lock their vehicles. I know ever since I've known you, I've heard that from your mouth every <laughs> single time. It, it baffles me that in this town, uh, people can't uh, understand that lock it everywhere, every time uh, concept. I wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night, I think, repeating that. It's, it's been going on for so long. And I have to tell you, in full honesty, I found a police commission minutes from 1950 something, and they were talking about people not oh, riding really? their cars. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's part of these OPM grant. We do, it's, it's an overtime grant, but we did print some flyers and we did some overtime at the uh, train stations. We're going to do some other locations as well, just with face to face discussions with folks, as I try to do every time I appear before some group. We try to have them help us best they can secure their own property. And with, with the dispatchers, do you guys have any more candidates sort of uh, on the perk here? Yep. I mean, I'd, I'd love not to be talking about this anymore. You and me both. This has been a decade-long uh, process as well. Um, we did extend the application for dispatcher applicants, I believe, out to the 24th, and I think we did pick up a few. It's not as many as I envisioned when this program was first developed and rolled out under Chief Lavello two chiefs ago. Um, I still think it's a very, very good job, and I think it's something that I thought we would have more candidates, but we do have some viable candidates coming down the pike, I think, in this, in this um, go-around. We did lose one dispatcher to resignation. We lost the dispatcher temporarily to military service. She's got up to a one-year deployment and we still have spots to fill. So we're actively in trying to fill those spots with competent professional personnel that we can put this to bed and continue on. Any other questions for the Chief? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Thank you. Okay, Parks and Rec. Good morning, Pam. Good morning. Good morning. I think my report speaks for itself. Um, I will highlight that um, we had an extremely successful event at Highland Farms on October 2nd. And um, being that it was our first really large event not being restricted because of COVID, um, it was very smooth and approximately 1,100 people showed up and uh, it was highly successful. So if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer. I just want to say thank you for all your hard work. It was fun to go this weekend to see a lot of the energy around the new pickleball courts and the basketball courts. So thank you for all your team. Yeah. Thank you. It was, a, it was a really nice was day. Fun. I was very surprised at how many people showed up for the ribbon cuttings. So the well, raffle is going to be the place to be, though. Yeah, it's a there. busy, yeah. busy park. Yeah. Oh, and clearly. There yes. was absolutely no parking. People were parking on the lawn. Um, anywhere they could find a little niche, but you know there was basketball going on, there was um, soccer, there was baseball, there were a uh, little event in the community gardens, there was the pickleball. So it was the playground was packed. So it just showed um, huge community you know, support and love for that park, which is great. Thank you. Can I just follow up? Thank you for the answers to the questions.
question. So yes. I said, and I, again, I apologize for sending him in. Yeah, no worries. Um, uh, with regard to Pear Tree Beach and the Park and Rec Commission uh, position, it makes total sense that they want to get make sure that the new uh, board of selectmen and everybody is, is, is on board with that. Is that with the whole project or just the building? No, the whole project. The whole project. Yeah, and they're going to be re revisiting that. Obviously, it's a big question. Everybody. Yeah, because your guys did a phenomenal. I was down at Pear Tree <clears> right <throat> after, the storm, and that that beach was almost gone. It's crazy. It yeah. was almost gone. So I, I just feel like that that episode to me, aside from that regular periodic summertime flooding that has been occurring for a while, uh, that episode confirms that it's urgent that we do something in regards to the beaches, the drainage, the slopage, what, I'm not an engineer, all those, you know, all those things mm -hmm. to preserve the asset for the town right. because it's critical. Uh, for the and as I mentioned, I mean, they're still in the approval process, so we haven't stopped there. No, that's, cl that's clear from your second note, and I just wanted to, uh, for clarification for my education, when you, in the second uh, comment, you reference uh, way from the USA COE review the closet samples uh, to receive sign off for the dredging portion. Does the dredging portion only apply to the boat ramp, or, does it, or is there a dredging that's going to be done along the back beaches? Well? No, only to the only to, to the boat ramp. Yeah, boat ramp. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. And uh, I will reiterate uh, other uh, folks' comments. The program that you've been doing in town is phenomenal, and it's clear from the Very excited that uh, you got Nikki to stay for uh, yeah. uh, for for another year, despite the, the troubles of pear tree. I'm confident you guys will work something out. Yeah, I think we will too. I think if we come up with a a, a unique plan to try to keep pear tree open, just can't look the same way as it did this past summer. But um, yeah. she's open to discussion, which is great. So yeah. and she's enthusiastic. It, she might, it might just be the people who go there and want different offerings than what. Is offered at the other place, and she, sh I'm sure, after a year of operating, she probably has a good idea. What to I think do. she'll man it differently. So she had, you know, two professional chefs that she was paying a lot of money to at both locations, and so it, it, it she was losing money every day at Pear Tree right. because of that. So she just, she'll probably have to man it differently. Yeah. So we'll see. I'll keep an open mind. Right. Excellent. Thank you. Questions for Pam? Hey, my one question on the tennis courts. Mm -hmm. um, the 250 won't cover the cost. So, what, what are you thinking as far as timing those? Well, the timing didn't change despite the money because even if we the 250 worked, we still wouldn't do the begin the work until next summer because the high school kids okay. use our courts for their tournaments and play in the spring. So, you know, Kate and I sat down and talked about it too. You know, perhaps materials will come down, so we're going to closely watch that as well, but in the meantime, we have to make a decision about putting some additional funds in there. Right. Because I think the smart way to go is post-tension these days. Mm -hmm. It lasts longer, um, so I've gotten a bid um, of 325 all the way, and another one for 337, uh, up, up, above and beyond the 250. Above that, okay. Mm -hmm. So it's about 75 to 90 more <coughs> with material costs. Just concrete <laughs> just went up. Fencing, concrete, it, it's, it's just yeah. crazy. They, they said it went from like $10 a yard to $25 a yard. Mm -hmm. Just as a quick add on to that, thank you for being a good steward of the town's funds and being careful um, with the budget. I would uh, just say uh, to you and the commission, don't be shy to ask. Uh, there are some contingency funds given around in different uh, locations. And I think that the, the residents of the And I also think too now that pickleball is so so big that um, we may need to I mean have a quote coming in just to see what that cost would be to if we're going to do reconstruction there we have space for four more courts at that tennis court Great. so at that same time rather than doing two different construction projects we may as well look to see what that cost would be to put four more courts in and I got to play firsthand on Sunday 
uh, first time ever. I and it. I have to say, I, I loved it. It was really great. I'm anxious to, Guilford just got four new pickleball courts as well. So I'm looking to buy my first racket. So it was great. It was a lot of fun. Tell me a little bit about uh, <coughs> the dredging until you're on Sure. They're um, going to be starting this fall. How deep are they going to go? Um, three to four feet. And they'll take the silt out um, and they're going to dry it there on the property and then they'll test it. And if it's test fine, um, we'll distribute the remaining bits in like different areas along the park that need to be filled. And if it if doesn't test well, they'll have to take it away. So when you're done, you're going to have a depth of roughly? Mm, I'm not totally certain. I just know that they were going to be going three to four feet more. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not sure what the Because that's a be. big uh, holding tank for when you have your storms. Right. And it hasn't been done in a very long time. I'm so, sure. Yeah. I think it's been about 40 years. Oh, wow. Or longer. <laughs> That's for the upper. That's the for the upper pond. The sedimentation right. Right. pond, you know, catches the silt. Mm -hmm. But at some time, <clears throat> some point in time, the town's going to have to talk about dredging Tilly Pond proper. Right. Right. Yeah. Haven't gone there yet. Yeah. But baby steps. We'll get this one done first. Well, it's, it's, it's quite yeah. important, you know, yes. as we look at the effects down the watershed. Yeah. Um, I have a couple questions and comments. Um, I was approached by the Nature Center about the charges for staff parking yes and so i just wanted to you know need to follow up on that conversation so i can understand mm -hmm. if there's been a change in policy of some kind so or change in the amount that's been charged um i i'm just in my six years um this is the first time we've run into that problem with a, in a, a daily use of the parking lot from their staff. I see. Um, <clears throat> so in the past, they we've charged for event parking. Mm -hmm. um, in the summertime, maybe last year and the year before, there might have been a week where they asked for parking, and we had a small charge for that. This particular year is the first time it's been that consistent. So they wanted it from you know about 12 to 14 parking spaces for three to four months, which again, speaking to how busy that park is, um, we put a small fee on it. It was $50 per day is what we typically would have charged, but we brought it down to $25 to be a good neighbor and helpful to them. But they literally do not have much parking. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm hearing that it's an expanded ask and hence the, the dramatic increase for the cost of parking. I'm glad Jeremy's here because it, it really crosses over into like, you know, parking issues as a result of maybe program expansions, which we love the Nature Center, we love their programs. I'm wondering if there's out of the box ways to think about parking there. Could, could they expand parking up toward uh, Brookside Road for their own benefit and incorporate that into the town lease? rather than using parking that's all the way across the park. Right. So, you know, I encourage the commission and your department to think um, strategically about that ongoing issue. Right, I agree with you. And I, I myself have been thinking about, you know, how they could expand. And I also think that the driveway, um, I mean, we've touched on it with the park master plan, but the, the, the fact that people idle there and there's, Yep. One way in, I mean, there's both ways in and out. I mean, it's just, it can be really troublesome. So mm -hmm. I think our commission also has to look at perhaps having just the one way and then an exit out yeah. near the ball field. I think might be something we really need to idea. look at. Okay. Yeah. Great, thank you. And I just want to, um, first of all, uh, a note that obviously David asked you a question about pear tree, and I do think that the rest of the board would benefit probably from hearing your answers to that. But sure. Um, I would like to acknowledge for the board's sake that we met with Pam. I wanted to have the commission come and talk to the Board of Selectmen and talk about Pear Tree Project, what the commission's desire is to move that project forward um, and what that looks like. To your point, David, you know, what does that mean? Boat ramp, parking lot, building, 
some of that, all of that, none of that. So um, it was the choice of the commission to wait until the new board of selectmen was seated. Um, so I, I respect that, but it's really important that, that we make a decision on, on that project. I agree wholeheartedly. I'm 100% with you. I just want, you know, I consider that to be a jewel of our town. Yep. And I want to make sure that we keep it, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, other, the, other, the other components uh, are, are, are important, too, because we need to do design. Let's do the whole thing if we can, right? Yep. Um, but let's make sure that we preserve the asset. Yeah, it's just a really important coordinated conversation between the future Board of Selectmen and the Parks and Rec Commission to get on the yeah. same page to move forward. I agree, and I, I do think cost-effectively, you know, to do the projects as a whole would be, you know, more efficient mm -hmm. than breaking it in three parts, but that's the commission's decision. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Pam. you. Okay. Okay, Jeremy, land use. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Um, as you can see, we'll start with the building department. Um, first off, a big shout out to Tamara Eberhardt and Lisa Mason, who really done yeoman's work in getting our new land use software up and running. Uh, as you know, we went live on August 23rd. That's been a, uh, a lot of work for them, a lot of work for other people in the department as we reimagine what can be done, uh, mostly for the convenience the general public who can now submit everything online at their convenience. They don't have to come into the building. They don't have to bring a check. Uh, they get better feedback from us. Uh, if there's something missing or wrong, it really ends up right in our email box when we first come into work. So uh, it's been a big success so far. We've gotten very, very, very few complaints, if any. So it's uh, I think the feedback we're getting from the public is very good. They're getting used to the system. It's a lot of time and effort for staff to figure out new ways of doing things, new ways of managing your workload, but it's been successful. And again, a lot of the credit goes to Lisa and Tamara for working with the public, but also working with the staff in both departments. Um, and of course, as soon as we went live on August 23rd, uh, the week after was September 1st, which affected both building and planning and zoning quite greatly. Uh, Kate's asked us to try to figure out how many hours we've spent talking to members of the public or out in the field investigating, looking at, analyzing, figuring out what the problem was, where there might be a solution, people who had water on their lawn, in their basement, in their first floor, was it, you know, everyone points to their uphill, most uphill neighbor. Is that really the problem? Was it solely the amount of rain? So, spent many, many, many hours, which we're still counting, in September dealing with that. So, we got two major things going on at once uh, that have taken up a substantial amount of staff time. The rest is outlined here in the report. Happy to answer any questions. Questions for Jim? Thank you. Thanks for the answer on the fees. I think maybe I didn't word the question very, uh, uh, very well, but I appreciate I appreciate the answer. It looks to me like the total fees for people affected by the floods so far, uh, based on your response, is about nineteen hundred bucks so far, and maybe another two to three thousand uh, dollars going uh, forward. Um, I wonder if you would consider waiving the other two to three thousand dollars as well meaning these are the residents and businesses that have just suffered substantial material financial loss and it doesn't look like the dollar cost here is very exorbitant to the town it's not super expensive and it would just it seems to me it'd be a nice way to show support for those residents and businesses if we didn't hit them with another five hundred dollars or thousand dollars at a time when they're already you know suffering significant loss right that's certainly a policy question uh, for the Board of Selectmen certainly uh, for someone who goes to a local land use board to rebuild planning and zoning environmental protection uh, we do owe the state of Connecticut $58 for each application and that is we waive everything except that state fee the $58 
relative to the building department fees, uh, again, that's up to the Board of Selectmen whether they wish to waive even more fees. Uh, one of the reasons, David, which you pointed out is to waive fees or reduce fees is to encourage people to get the permits to rebuild. Sadly, not everyone gets the permits because they believe it's costly and it's going to slow them down. So what we've tried to do is expedite those permits, waive the fees, so our folks can make sure everything's being done properly. Certainly there's, if your carpet gets wet, to put down a new carpet, you don't need a building permit. But there are certainly people out there that have not gotten the proper permits to rebuild. There's also the issue, too, that sometimes when people rebuild, they change things, they add on, they, they make enhancements. So I'm fully supportive and always have been about waiving fees for people that have suffered a hardship. But if they're going to make improvements above and beyond, I think there's probably reason to charge a fee of some kind anyway. I actually don't know about that. That's yeah, the, that's, there are a lot good. of, while I'm at it, yeah. yes. type permit. Yeah. While, while I already have the wall taken down, let me do this. Yes. Right. Let me put up a different wall, or while I'm finishing re correcting the problem in the basement, let me just bump it up. So yeah. Yeah. that's what we want to take a look Fair at enough. as well. So. Yep. Jeremy, um, thank you. Great work on the parking opt-out last night with the RTM. It's hard to even remember when the RTM might have voted unanimously on something that could have been more controversial. I'm glad it wasn't here. I'm glad we're all in agreement about that. Um, do you know when the, uh, the question was asked last night on the, in the meeting, when the commission will take up the question of ADUs and when will the commission take up the question about um, allowing for uh, dispensaries for adult use cannabis? The changes in the state statutes last year really dumped a lot of things in planning and zoning commission's laps, including parking opt out, accessory dwelling units. They moved up the required affordable housing plan by 30 days, so we have less time to do it. Why they did that, I have no idea. And then marijuana dispensaries. So uh, I've spoken with Chairman Steve Ovani. Uh, really 2022 will be another full year for the planning and zoning commission dealing with those four issues. Accessory dwelling units, marijuana, <laughs> dispensaries, affordable housing plan, and then there's I'm sure other things, and that's assuming no other statute or laws change, but of course we're, as you know, Jamie, we're already hearing rumblings and grumblings coming out of Hartford for more things for the commission to do right away. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I think, well. 2022 then is the answer that I'm hearing. Yes, starting in which 2022 sadly is yeah. <laughs> 70 days away. Correct. So it's a the commission's going to be very busy next year working on all of those projects, which, according to state statute, we can't ignore. They have to be addressed. Yeah. Other questions for Jeremy? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Uh, IT. Good morning, George. Good morning, guys. Everyone's welcome. Uh, just the servers that we're doing is still in the town and also at the police station. Just upgrades over there that's going on. Munis, a lot of upgrades. Munis is changing over to new servers. Uh, and also, I guess Jeremy's, you know, moving from City View to the new Open Gov. Uh, nothing further to add if you guys have any questions. Questions for George? Thank you. No. George, thank you for saving my IT life over the last 12 years. You got it. Hey, it's been good. Like I said yesterday in your office. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, couldn't have done it without you. Thank you. Okay, um, human service. Allie. Good morning. Um, so as you can see, we had a successful back to school program again. Um, it's up slightly from last year. We had 120 kids last year and 126 this year. And the families are thrilled they're with the Target gift cards because then they're in control. They can take their kids shopping and pick out exactly what they want. So it's working out really, really well. And thank you to all the members, as I mentioned in my report, in the community and different organizations who've donated because we rely heavily on that support. Um, and bear with us on the charity tracker, our new statistics. Um, you know, we're, it's 
a new endeavor, and the five of us in our office are trying to figure out what, how best to present the information to you. So going forward with the next Board of Selectmen, we'll welcome feedback as to what kind of information you want. All we're reporting there is a client, direct client contact. So it doesn't, it doesn't you know, encompass like all the other kind of administrative meetings, reports, and all of that, but um, we're welcome you know, to whatever, whatever everyone wants to know. Because I know, David, you had asked me about the previous years, and we used, well, I think that is a good point, that we can compare this quarter to last quarter so you can see the numbers and how they're changing. Yeah, honestly. I mean, last year. I know you guys do tremendous work. I just don't have a good sense for is it more, is it less? That kind of thing, right? It's not that much dramatically. It's not dramatically more since the since COVID hit, and I think I've said this in various other meetings. We're all kind of still waiting on the edge of our seats. Like I think for our low-income families, the stimulus money, the extended unemployment, the child tax credits, all of those things are significant if you're on a very low income. Um, so now that those things, not all of them, but have kind of come to an end, where an eviction moratorium is 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 has been lifted and the um, shutoff moratorium. We're hoping there's not an influx of need, but we anticipate there could be, so we're just kind of waiting to see. Well, as I said in my comments to you, I'm continually amazed by the amount of help and support you provide to our lower income families. And uh, I'm not sure that everybody, I certainly wasn't aware of the level of need uh, in the community. Uh, with the 126 families that you mentioned. The one that frightens me is 28 households have food insecurity in town. And I would think in a town like ours, food insecurity would be zero. And actually, I think it's more than that. Those are just the families that Those participate the that, that, come in the, the, that come for the food. So there's a lot of people who are embarrassed to come for the food, which is why we're doing it here and not in the schools. Um, or just, it's hard for people to accept help. So I, I, I know I asked this question, you provided an answer, but I'd like you to tell people so that it's on the tape. Uh, I, I would love for the town uh, and more town residents to be more active in supporting your efforts uh, in the town. So since next quarter is gonna be your busiest, mm -hmm. what's the best way for town residents to help you help our neighbors? So back to food insecurity. We always make sure that all of the seniors and families that we work with at both Thanksgiving and the holidays have food gift cards. So that's a very easy thing for people to do. They can mail them to us, they can drop them off, whatever works, or make a donation and we can purchase them with the donation. Um, but that is definitely something we make sure that every active client of ours is, has some food gift card over the holidays for each of the holidays. And I think in your answer you mentioned adopting a senior or a family. Oh yes, and that's how, the other part. How, how, would, how would a resident, how does a resident do that? Just reach out to our department. And we're going to be advertising it soon, believe it or not, we have to start that. <laughs> it kind of sneaks up on you, but um, yeah, last year we had all of the families that we were working with adopted and, and seniors. We actually got to the point where we were all set and there were still people who were interested. So it's wonderful and it's, and it's just good for those who participate and donate. It's very rewarding for them and obviously for our families. And seniors. Well, uh, I'm sure every single person on this board feels the same way. For those of us that are very fortunate, let's make sure that everyone in our town, you know, en enjoys a little bit. So reach deep, give off, and give more. Thank you. So I'll follow up on that a little bit. Um, I love that people are so generous to your department. Um, your department is really the most boots on the ground with COVID impacts. Mm -hmm. And I think your department will have a large voice when the ARPA steering committee begins their work to talk about how COVID has, you know, economically impacted our town residents. So, you know, please let us know, how, you know, if we can be using ARPA money to support your department's efforts um, in any way. Because while I appreciate very much. Um, private donations to support your work. I also believe that, you know, we as a town um, should be supporting your work as well. Thank you. I think where there could be a good use of those funds is if someone comes, you know, if their evictions start to yeah. increase, because um, those sums are gonna be out of any kind of money of money that we have in our department. Um, I know we've talked about this before, or if there's a shutoff notice for someone who hasn't paid their electric bill and it's $3,000, yeah. it has to be paid in full. So. Those are some things that are way out of our typical human service budget that we sure. would probably look to get the ARPA funding. Just need to try and figure out how to estimate. It's um, kind yeah, of hard. It, I know. I know it's really hard, and uh, 
you know, we could be talking about significant amounts of money, mm -hmm. but it'll be important to drill down on some estimates. Well, two of the evictions that we had, um, well, actually they were in the last quarter, were both for non-payment of rent for over a year. And that was substantial. I mean, two different, in, or two different levels of rent and stuff. One was a house, one was an apartment, but very, very large sums of money. One was, I think, $14,000 and the other one was like forty-five. Yeah, so um, we'll have to, you know, it's, it's a complex issue because there, there, are, there are monies for mm -hmm. landlords yep. um, nice from the federal government that haven't been released yet. So, oh. Or, you know, they, uh, uh, the last statistic I saw was that 14% of the monies that have been given for uh, rental assistance have not been distributed. So, you know, uh, we, got, we have to sort out, you know, who, whose role it is to uh, support that funding. So right. we look forward to those conversations. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Al? Yeah, thank you for all that you do. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much, Al. Okay. Human resource, Lori. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I just have one update to my report, and that is um, yesterday we did meet with the Public Works Union, and we did reach agreement on having service ratings, um, and that was the last employee group uh, that we were trying to get that um, process with. So that will begin with Public Works employees in the spring, um, and now all of our employees are on some type of performance evaluation plan on an annual basis, so I think that is great progress. Uh, great. And, and that's all I have um, for new information. Are there any questions? Sir, I had one. I'm just curious, and, and you may not or may not know the answer off your head, um, how many open positions are there right now in the town of Darien? That we have, we have a couple posted right now, two posted. Okay. Um, I know it's a tough job market. It is, and I will say that I've certainly noticed a difference, um, particularly with part-time positions. They're difficult to fill. Um, I've been with the town for five years now, and this is the first time that we've had difficulty filling positions. And even with some of our full-time positions, it's carried over. Um, I know the chief talked about the dispatcher positions. Uh, you know, trying to get those positions fully staffed has been a challenge. <coughs> So we're definitely in challenging times right now. Um, you know, posting online uh, has always worked for us in the past, but that's not always working now. So we're trying to come up with some more creative ways um, to get, get the word out. eligible applicants to apply. Thank you. Yeah, can I, can I be specific here, Lori, and talk about the communications position that we posted? Sure. So um, zero respondents for that job. And, uh, you know, so I think the, the conversation for the Board of Selectmen to work with um, you and Kate to see if that job description has to be revised in some way, or, um, you know, on my Christmas list would be making that a full-time position if there can be enough work for that individual. But we know the financial implications of that. Um, but you know, we certainly—it's—it's it's not a good thing when you get zero respondents no, for a job. No, 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 no. no. It's, it's definitely tough times. We've had a couple yeah. of other uh, positions where we've gotten a couple of applications for part-time positions, and that's very unusual. Different times that we're in job. right now. Yeah. Yep. Well, it, it is a tough job market. Yeah. Except there are lots of jobs. I think. Mean, yeah. <laughs> Finding the right people for them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely that's true. Jamie, that's, a, that's really interesting that what, what you mentioned about that communications thing. Maybe that's one of the things where uh, in looking at the job description, if we can sort of build it out to make it more, ta yeah. more tasks and more responsibilities to justify making it a full-time position. Yeah, and, and, and maybe it could be coordinated with other parts of town somehow. I don't know how to do that, but, you know, somewhere. I've, I've had some conversations with other town bodies about that. Uh, they weren't ready to move on that kind of uh, joint position, but I think it's certainly worth further discussion. Yeah. Monica. Yes. Sorry, one question. The OSHA um, audio testing, is that the first time they've done that? Yes. 
Yep. Yep. So we're doing the baseline testing on all Public Works employees, uh, and then it will be an annual testing after that. But this is the first initial testing. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, Lori. Thanks, Lori. Do we have David Canal? You guys can all. Somebody tell the next group on in. He was in. He was in group B. Well, we adjusted because we lost a seat. The podium wasn't supposed to be uh, there. Okay. And we lost a seat, so we gave it to the classroom. Okay. We're all out there. Okay. Yeah, so just, just a note, like, David, you asked some really, really good questions of the department heads. I recommend going forward that when people ask those questions that when you get the answers back, maybe you could distribute them, you know, board members could distribute them so everybody could have the benefit of hearing the answers, because yeah. I think they're a good question. Okay, great. Thank you. Good morning, Group C. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Okay, we'll kick right off with our Fire Marshal, good morning, Bob. Oh, no, sorry, okay. sorry, sorry. Because David was supposed to be in Group <coughs> B, we're gonna move you to number one in Group C. I was moved, yes. Yes, good morning, good morning David. Pleasantly. Yes. Oh. Give me plenty of time to listen to the uh, State Department of Education and Public Health on their webinar this morning, giving us the COVID updates. Okay, give us the update. But before we get to COVID, let's <laughs> talk about some other things. Um, I want to thank the board for their support over the past couple of years. It's been interesting for all of us, I'm sure, between COVID and flooding and <laughs> various other issues that have come along in the past year. And I wish you all the best. Um, and thank you again thank you. for your support. Um, a bit of good news, more good news. Um, Jamie knows, we, uh, the town of Darien has once again received an award from the state uh, in recognition of community efforts to improve survival from sudden cardiac arrest as a heart safe community. I believe this is the fourth time that we've gotten this, uh, this award. Um, thanks to the collaborative work with uh, Post 53 in putting together the data. And uh, we are also the only community, as far as I know, that has the AED locations on the town website throughout the community. So we've worked with PNC to get that on the GPS. So on the HeartSafe insignia, on the town website, you click on that and a map will come up where you can see where all the AEDs in town are. Great. Um, another thing today is our seasonal flu clinic. It's going on start at 10 o'clock, 10 to 12.30. We're encouraging town hall employees, town employees, not just town hall employees, but all employees to uh, come to our seasonal flu clinic today. Um, we've also initiated a town hall first aid program. Uh, we're going to try to put together a team that could respond to any kind of an emergency that would occur in the town hall. And we focus on, of course, CPR, Stop the bleed, uh, Narcan administration, because you just never know when you may have to save a life. And those few seconds and minutes before the emergency responders show up can be critical in saving lives. Uh, the other thing I'd like to add is that uh, as of last week, we've started working with Stanford Hospital as they're doing their community health needs assessment update. Uh, they have to do that every three years, and uh, um, we're, we're engaged with that process as well. Now we can talk COVID. <laughs> and, you know, when, when I do these reports, you know, uh, a couple days ahead of time, there's always news that comes on the morning of the meeting. Uh, so we're, it's been two years of constant flux, for the most part, constantly trying to stay up to and ahead of. And one thing that I want to make sure that everybody understands right now uh, is that all this talk about you know, booster shots and the approvals, at this point, the only booster that's been approved is Pfizer. There's been recommendations for approval that still have to go through a process. So there are no other booster shots available other than Pfizer. 
And at this point, still, it's recommended that if you got Pfizer to begin with, you still get the booster of Pfizer. If you got Moderna, when Moderna is available and it's not yet, uh, then you would get Moderna as a booster and the same with Johnson & Johnson. At this point, it still stay with what you had the first time through. Uh, <clears throat> so um, we've done, we're doing well here in town. Summary, you know, uh, our case counts are down. They continue to stay low. Our vaccination rates are extremely high. We're over 90% fully vaccinated in town. Um, so, uh, and we're not seeing any particular increase in numbers of cases for school-aged children that aren't vaccinated though we do plan on once that vaccine is available offering clinics for school-aged kids on saturdays in the gym we're in, in discussions with uh, the school board on the, on actually managing that and then we'll also be offering we plan to offer boosters as well once they're available but we will only be offering moderna and johnson and johnson we're not going to get into the Pfizer business. It's hard to manage two vaccines, let alone try to manage three. So um, there's plenty of vaccine available at our pharmacies. There will be vaccine available at our pharmacies, and there's alternate places for people to get vaccinated this time around, whereas last time we were kind of the only act in town when it started. So um, we've been getting calls from people wanting to get on lists, we're not taking lists at this point because we feel that it may be, people may be able to get vaccinated at pharmacies more quickly than they can through us because we can't order the vaccines yet for boosters. Um, I checked yesterday and the state health department is still saying, not yet, not until you get the final CDC approvals. Um, the school, one, one other update that I wanted to give to you is, is that the schools have been doing testing for the under 12 year olds. There have been two, two rounds of testing, two weeks in a row. Each time there's been about 250, 260 tests done and they have not had a single positive result from that testing screening program as yet. So again, terrific news. Otherwise, that would be my report and take any questions you might have. Thank you, David. Questions for David? No questions. Very cautiously optimistic. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, David. Okay, um, now Fire Marshal Bob. Good morning, all. Um, I would like to thank all of you for all of your continued support. Um, I'm going to miss having you all around over to a new board, um, but I know you're all not going far, so. <laughs> uh, my report pretty much stands some of the highlights, the uh, big construction projects that are moving along Federal Realty on Heights Road, um, that looks like a giant lumber yard right now. Uh, yep. The Baywater project, which just started on the east side um, with the gas station and the two buildings on Corbin being torn down. They are now uh, digging and blasting over there. Uh, for underground parking. Uh, Oxbridge School continues to move. The good news that I learned last week was that the plan is to not rush to try and move in the span of a week over April break um, into the new building, but to do it over the summer and uh, move the kids in in September for phase one of the move. Um, the East Lane um, Abel Abelis is just about complete. Um, really the only thing they have left there is a couple odds and ends on our in the building department uh, and they'll be ready to start moving in. Um, some of the excitements with the storms, a couple minor fires, but otherwise I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Bob, Maya, yes. I wanted to ask you this dry ice situation. Yes. Calm down at me. Is this, um, do you see this as a problem? So a problem? this was as a result of the storm and no power at the restaurant. In the July storm, he had lost power and lost a considerable amount of product. So he thought he was doing the right thing by using the dry ice. 
as it melts, it becomes carbon dioxide, eats the oxygen in the um, in the air, and, and in this case, it was in the walk-in. So it created a dangerous situation, no ill means on the owner's part, and it was kind of a lesson learned for everyone. And thankfully, the health department had been out doing the inspections, and they're the ones that caught it and alerted us to it. But that's like a one-off. That is a total one-off, yeah. That, in my 35 plus years, I've never seen it with all the storms we've been right. through the power outages. Any other questions for Bob? Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Okay, finance. Jen. Good morning. Um, our focus right now is finishing up the audits and we're getting started on the budget. We're going to be kicking off with the departments this week. Um, audits expected to wrap up late November. Um, it's a, Bloom Shapiro was acquired by CLA, so there's a few differences this year. It's taking a little longer to work through some things because CLA has a slightly different process, but we don't anticipate any problems and we'll be filing on time. Questions for Jen? Uh, Jen, my comment, uh, uh, your explanation you provided on the uh, note from attachment one, page five, mm -hmm. uh, your explanation is perfect. Uh, the way the note actually reads was what confused me because it made me think that the entire $2 million shortfall was due to the under budgeting of the investment funds. So uh, that was really just meant to, this is what I was expecting to see. <laughs> and then I saw that note and I was like, wait, we can't, we, we can't be $2 million under budget on the investment funds. It's, it's not that much. Um, were you, do you know off the top of your head since 2008 has the town run a deficit in the operating budget in any calendar year? We have not in the time since I'm... Can I? Yeah, go right ahead. So um, we used to, on a regular basis, budget to run an operating deficit. So we used to um, assume that we would run about a million dollar operating deficit. You would see a revenue source in the budget of fund balance for like a million, million, 1.1 million. So what we were doing was saying our revenues, we expect to be $1 million less than our expenses. So we were actually assuming we would run an operating deficit. We did sometimes. Never to the point of the million dollars that we assumed. You know, sometimes it might be a $300,000 operating deficit, but never more than we had assumed we would run. And that, when you did your earlier discussion about the tax collection rate, yeah. that was part of the change the Board of Finance made, is that they no longer are assuming that million dollar operating deficit. They're increasing <coughs> the revenue anticipated to come from the taxes. Right, it was two pieces. It was a contra budgeted contribution from fund balance and a lower assumed tax collection rate. Right. Both of those have changed. There's no longer the budgeted contribution from fund balance and now the assumed collection rate has a different calculation method. Yeah, because I was looking to see if there had ever been a period where there was a, a, a deficit that wasn't intended. There's never been a real deficit, there's you never, know. So there's never been a real deficit which goes back to the consistency of the collection rate. Yes. Uh, historically, in the conservative way that we budget with the 25 basis points built into the uh, assumed budget collection rate, uh, <coughs> which, uh, which, le which, which leads me to the other thing that I asked you about, which was the reserve at 17%. Uh, uh, versus the 20% uh, target, it strikes me that it would be uh, incredibly difficult for the town to run a deficit large enough to draw down $8 million. Right, and the, the guidance, um, it's the Board, of fund, the Board of Finance's fund balance policy, and the yep. guidance is to maintain a minimum of 12%, yep. not maintain 12%, so no, I got you. I got you. that's something that they revisit every year during the budget discussion. Yeah. Um, and there is, there is an acknowledgement that it's a above the minimum, um, but for reasons. Uh, I think I'll have a chance to comment on that next year. <laughs> All right, thanks you guys. Oh, okay, one last question. The, the info that you sent out over the summer, I apologize, I should know this, and uh, it's escaping me. Did that, on the capital stuff, did that include 
the methodology for the ranking, like what makes it a one, what makes it a two, what makes it a four, you know, and, and did it include like a sample of what the five-year forward budget forecast will look like? Um, well, the five-year forecast, we've been doing six-year capital plans yep. for decades. Okay. So, um, are those others typically present, have they been presented in the book and I have just missed them? Um, not in the you, book, there not is a separate. Book, but it, it's a separate, it's a separate um, item that you get, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, apparently a lot of people missed it, so. <laughs> um, it's on our website. Um, it's a separate, it is a separate file um, that you would all get. Um, so, to your first question, um, no, the methodology has not, methodology has not been shared. Only the ranking categories, and that was deliberate on my part. Okay. Um, I wanted department heads to be aware of what we would be considering when evaluating their um, their projects, right. but not the actual um, the actual methodology. You know, like what's worth. It, it, I think if you look at them, you can probably figure out which things are worth the most. Right. You know, like um, you know the accuracy of your budget. You know, if you already have a bid in hand, you know that's going to be more valuable. Um, but not every category is weighted the same. Right. Um, and again, like I, it was deliberate on my part not to share. No, the that's, that's fair enough. I'll go back and look at the, uh, at the, at the categories uh, from your uh, prior email. Because I think that the whole thing uh, where I was driving with that is as we, we seem to have been, been making a shift away from the reserving for capital items, right? Mm -hmm. Which is going to increase the potential need for the Board of Finance to look at bonding for items, and if they have five, five year forward forecasts subject to change every year, we understand, uh, they might be able to look to see, to find out if there are any periods of lumpiness where between the Board of Ed and the, and the town, like, so, oh, and this year it looks like it's going to be very lumpy, so we need to figure out how to manage that. And that, that is an important thing for the Board of Finance to consider, um, you know, the forecast, the, the five year plan, I don't want to differ from the from the forecast that the chairman of the board of finance presents, um, the five-year plan does contemplate revenue sources, and um, but it's the town plan, so it would be up to the board of finance to integrate. You know, <clears throat> looking at the town plan and say, you know, oh, in fiscal 26, it looks like there's going to be a big knock for the town. What does the board of ed have going on? Right. Right. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Any other questions for Jen? I owe you some information on the Oxbridge re yes. reset for the bonding purposes. I'll get it to you shortly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jen. Good luck in the next budget. Thank you. Okay. Emergency management. Mark. <clears throat> Morning, everyone. Morning. Pleasure to see you in the last meeting all together. Mm -hmm. Look forward to the new boards. Uh, look forward to keeping our friendships going forward. Um, one, one word defines my report, flood. Um, ever since the July 9th storm, we've gone through the post-storm damage assessments, and we moved into the September storm, and then we've been on the post-storm damage assessments for the state. Um, there was no relief for ELSA. Uh, I don't know if there's going to be any relief for Ida. I have not received any glowing information from FEMA's crews. They are very close fisted with their cards. They don't show them. So I don't have any more information on that going forward. Um, I was told on Thursday afternoon about six o'clock that they were reporting to the governor that week. Um, so I think if there's gonna be any kind of movement on this, we should hear about it this week or next. Um, that's pretty much my report. If you have questions on specifics, we got to take them. I apologize. I forgot to ask this in the uh, email that I sent. It looks like you guys have already filed data for both with the state mm -hmm. for both ELSA and IDA. Correct. Do you remember off the top of your head uh, how many total claims and what the dollar volume amounts mm -hmm. So we don't deal with dollars. Okay. Um, damage assessments are done by categories of damage, destroyed, major, minor, and affected. Uh, okay. 
if I can put this in a perspective, <laughs> affected is you get a little water in your basement, but you mop it up and everything's good. Right. Minor is when you start damaging your home, um, whether it be a furnace or electrical outlets that get flooded or whatever. Um, to get to the next categories, you really have to damage your living quarters. Many people in this town have um, finished basements. A lot of them are probably in zones that shouldn't be a finished basement. Um, so major disaster is the damage that FEMA comes out to look at and review and to verify. We don't go to the other categories. Uh, and at that, it's hard enough to do that in one day. We ended up doing it in two for Ida. Um, it, it, approximately 72 homes were viewed in Ida from our team that went out on this past Thursday and the week before. We had 200, roughly 200 um, homeowners report damage to us. But I do want to add that many people do not report damage to us. It's not uncommon for us to be out on our inspection the other day, for instance, and have one homeowner tell us about other homeowners in their neighborhood. That so would, that we, would be me included. So we may have one or two that we acknowledge or, or have on our report, and we find out there's five or six or seven in that general neighborhood. So a couple, a couple hundred homes. So it's definitely, the numbers are definitely lower than what really truly is out there. Uh, right. and, and I presume that there were uh, a number of businesses also. So um, I'd say about 12 businesses were affected majorly, is the best way to put it. Um, many are, are um, prior damage reports too. You know, prior storms have had flooding. Uh, the couple shockers in Ida that people hadn't been flooded prior, like Stop and Shop, for instance, and Goodwife Shopping Center. You know, the shopping center itself used to get water in the parking lot, but I, I don't ever remember it getting into the stores. Um, a new one also was the Museum of Darien, the old historical society. That was damaged. Um, but for the most part, many of these buildings are ones that are on our radar, if you will. Yes? The 200 number, is that cumulative for both storms or just for Ida? Just for Ida. Thank you. It was about 150 for Elsa. Thank you. Mark, so I know you've collected names for FEMA and the SBA, so if this is designated, do you automatically reach out to those people to start the process? So <clears throat> basically, once the governor makes his decision, we'll let people know. It's kind of premature at that point until the president you know, declares it. But you do that. But we'll you keep them informed that. of all the steps. Okay. Mark, where are we with the homeowners that are filing for lifts or uh, demolitions, talent acquisitions? So just so we're all on the same page, um, <clears throat> we've had about 12 dozen uh, homeowners 12 dozen. who 12 are dozen. seeking. 12, 12 or a dozen? Uh, not yeah. 12 dozen. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> tough one. Thanks. Oh, wow. Went to a call already today. Um, yeah, so it's 12. Uh, maybe max 15, because it seems like every once in a while I get a phone call from someone I have not, not known about, so to speak. Um, they're, they're all listed. We're working on them. Uh, when I say we're, it's me. I'm a department of one with no administrative help. Um, these storms have led to all these damage assessments, which have taken me away from applying on anyone's behalf. The current um, brick, as it's called, and FMA applications are due November 29th. And the hazard mitigation grant program for this current year, which we just voted on the prior year, or two years ago, um, this one is due January 12th. And so I only have one application that's in process. Many of the homeowners always want to jump on the bandwagon, but they have a lot of homework to do for me to get information to the state on their behalf. So it's not, um, the easiest way I can put it is an application is very difficult in itself. Uh, it's very time consuming. There's a cost benefit ratio that it has to hit. And if you don't hit that, it's you're applying basically on merit only and, and that doesn't happen. So um, 
For instance, it took Crimmins Road nine prior floods with um, damage that's almost you know, 500 to a million dollars worth of damage. So these people that have only flooded once or twice, though I'm going to apply on their behalf, that the likelihood of them getting a grant is very slim. And when the state was here um, for Ida the first time, the state grants officer was on that team and he said that they're not even gonna do elevations. So elevations are not gonna be a priority at all. It's all acquisitions. Um, they're finding that acquisitions alone is really the only way to mitigate mm -hmm. future flooding. So um, I think I think that the state is changing their model, the FEMA is definitely changing their model, what they're looking for. And with sea level rise, that, that puts a new take on it or climate change, whatever you want to call these things these days, um, is putting a new priority list together for them because I was shocked when he said it. I was more shocked when he told one homeowner in particular that if they got the application in right away, they would work on it right away, which uh, Crimmins Road took three years. And it was many months after the deadline that they reviewed it. Once they start the review process, we start getting email exchanges back and forth. Yep. Things that they'll look for, things that they don't like a certain way, they want you to rerun re -run the uh, benefit cost analysis. Um, and that wasn't done for months later, almost a year later for FEMA to start their discussions on it. So I, I am shocked that someone would tell a homeowner that who's feeling desperate at, you know, right after a flood that they can work on it right away. So a couple things to come to mind. Um, we have expressed that we will get you whatever help you need. Mm -hmm. You know, if you need, if we need to bring in, you know, um, per diem services to help put applications together to gather all that information. Uh, I think we have an opportunity here if there are a number of properties that are looking for that kind of FEMA assistance to to get those in, get those in process, we can only do what we can do. We can't affect the FEMA, you know, what FEMA does once those applications mm -hmm. go there. But to consider packaging up, you know, a number of, of these, some may, may get attention of FEMA, some may not because they haven't had prior claims. But, right. you know, I think it would be in our best interest to look at our application, applications to FEMA as, a project, a larger project in and of itself. So we will give you whatever resources that you need to get those applications in process and completed. I, I appreciate that and I can only say that with with the damage assessments that have happened, yep. my focus went from one project to a different project. So it really, I'm one person, yeah. I can only think about right. one thing at a time and achieve something at a time, so yep. to speak. Um, I would say if we started today, you would have a hard time meeting the November 29th deadline. I, even if you hire a team of 12 people to do it, it's a very time consuming process to apply to FEMA. It's, it's a very lengthy document and what's involved is very intricate information that has to be sought out by the town's people and as, as well as the homeowner. So just the process of having everybody coordinate their communications is a challenge in itself so um, it's not that I don't want to apply I would definitely apply for everybody that's asking um, certainly I don't want to be that person that holds anybody up but it's it's not going to happen quickly the state hasn't even communicated to me that the that brick and FEMA our FMA grant application is open I got that through you from Westcock which I find very interesting because the state's usually the communicator to the emergency management directors. So in that case, I mean, I'm not saying I don't, I'm not aware of it, but not knowing it directly from the state, I don't know how we can expect to apply in such a short period of time. It's, it's a typical statement in my, in my years of doing emergency management, emergency management grant applications, they never give us enough time to do a thorough job. By the time we receive it and it's due in, you're, you're behind the eight ball, so to speak. You're trying to play catch up quickly. And the only thing that was a benefit to the prior owners on Crimmins Road is that we kept applying cycle after cycle, so eventually we got the information we needed to make a great application. 
but the first go around it was not great. And I'm not, it's just the deadlines are unrealistic, is my way of putting it. Not, by any means, I'm not saying I won't do it. But oh, I haven't even been able to concentrate on trying to work through you getting me somebody. You know what I mean? How that's going to work out. So I haven't had a, enough time and effort to concentrate on how we can get someone. And if they're doing it remotely, that means we have to provide them all this information. But I'm more than interested in trying to get that worked out. Yes. Imperative. Questions for Mark? Questions. Uh, I just, uh, be, being a Heights resident, I have one last comment. If people don't know, Pavalas is back open again. If you have never met Danny, that man has an indomitable spirit. He does. It's infectious, uh, and it, it's a huge asset for the town. Go get lunch, go get breakfast. Let's make sure that he gets back on his feet. Absolutely. Um, I did that with the FEMA crew on uh, Thursday. Thank you. And they were actually, when I, I didn't tell them up front what happened, because they weren't this different crew from the prior time. But when we went there and we got done with lunch, I said, the reason I brought you there is because it was a business that was affected by the storm. And they were mm -hmm. very appreciative to that and acknowledged that, so. Um, Many of the businesses are hurting, and, and uh, Stop and Shop, for instance, when we went and talked to the managers there, um, they don't even acknowledge that we exist. They deal with corporate only, so they really had nothing to say to us. We were aware of the loss. They had an approximate dollar value, but to help SBA understand the process, they were not really helpful. Yes, yeah, so and that's... That's concerning to me, and I'm going to share in my first selectman's report a conversation, the meeting that we had with Congressman Himes last Thursday. Those initial damage assessments are apparently critical. And so I, I, I'd like to continue a dialogue about the process for that, because um, getting, getting in as much information about damage, you know, we, we know of the one property, there are seven more in the neighborhood that don't report. So we have to change, I think, we have to look at our internal process to do community canvassing in a different way so that we can capture you know, all of that information that is so foundational to FEMA making, uh, you know, reaching the thresholds for emergency declarations. I think it's crazy that they had to come here twice. I think it's crazy that we're over 45 days from the storm and there hasn't been a declaration when Westchester County had it in early September. So, um, you know, Connecticut has some things to work on, and I think that we, we here, you know, can work on, um, I'd love your thoughts on, on a different kind of process to reach out and get that information from. from yeah, folks. I mean, we, what we used to do to what we do now is night and day. I mean, years yeah. ago, it was a door-to-door -door knock on yeah. type of activity. You know, we knew where to go because of prior storms and things like that. So yeah. we start knocking on doors right after the event. Now we make it as easy as can be. We publicize it. We send out code reds and we tell people how to do it. And, it, and we get a good turn. I mean, it's yeah. the numbers are far exceeding what we used to get back in you know 20 years ago, for instance, or 2007 floods. But um, yeah, it's it's a state process and federal process. So. Our local process, I think, is working well. It still has some bugs to yeah. eliminate, so to speak. But uh, I think a lot of people just don't like to share for some reason. I mean, I have people that actually emailed me and said, I will not share my pictures with you. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't know what you're going to use them for um, and things like that. So there's a privacy concern, obviously. Right. Well, every storm, every storm provides an opportunity for improvement. So, Monica. So Mark, you, I'm going back to this hiring 12 people wouldn't, wouldn't solve the problem. So what do you, what, what could we do to help you? I, I, I guess the biggest thing is yesterday we needed five or six people to start, you know, and then if it had been done after Elsa, so to speak, because Elsa's when the process started. All these people are new to it, you know, people saying I want to apply for lifting or acquisitions um, that was done with Elsa item might have brought two or three more people to us but it, the majority and the bulk of people were right after July 9th so and 
just so you know, I solicited everybody that wrote us that had major damage. I went out to their homes and met them and discussed this with them. So that was my process of trying to reach out to them. These grants are available, you know, an elevation or an acquisition may help you. I don't know your circumstances. This is the process. It's not quick. That's the one thing everybody wants. They want something done immediately. And it's, it's, it's not our process, it's the federal government. So it's the first thing I warn them is it takes two to three years. Any other questions for Mark? The only thing I'd like to add is that um, one thing that our team has found out through going door to door is that many people misunderstand flood insurance. Everyone can get flood insurance, and that's the one number one takeaway is whether you're a renter or you're a homeowner, business owner, whatever, flood insurance is available, and it's almost as important as having your vehicle insurance. In a town that's surrounded by water, uh, five watersheds that intersect it, streams everywhere, um, most likely you have some flood risk. It's really important. That would help people very quick compared to what the assistance that you mentioned 45 days out and we're still waiting. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. By the way, Mark, um, when we were on the call with Dennis, mm -hmm. um, they mentioned your name a couple times and they appreciate how well you work with them. So That's good to hear. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, EMS. Since we had another meeting. Thanks, Bob. Good morning, John. Good morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of POST, I'd like to thank you all for your service and all that this board has done for our organization over the last uh, few years. Um, again, as I mentioned on my report, I'm very pleased to announce that POST was the recipient of the 2021 National EMS Volunteer Service of the Year Award. Uh, I had the pleasure of going down with several adults and kids to Atlanta to receive the award. Um, so, again, it wasn't possible without the support that we get from the town, the community at large, and everyone, so thank you. Congratulations. Um, the only thing that I'll highlight is we had the busiest three-month period that we've ever had, uh, call volume-wise, uh, at post, doing 482 calls over the last three months. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, um, they're working hard, uh, for sure, um, our kids and our uh, adult advisors, but, uh, still there to meet the needs. So um, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Do you attribute the, uh, the high call volume to the fact that people are, are now back out and about and they're out and about in a big way? In a big way, yes, <laughs> I believe so. Um, okay. You know, I think this summer has really just seen an uh, uh, explosion of activity and people being out and the roadways being uh, crowded. Anecdotally, it seems even more so than pre-pandemic uh, traffic-wise, so I think that all plays a role. Okay. Questions for Jeff? No, well, thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Very thank proud you very of Post 53. Awesome. Okay, Millie, tax assessor. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is my first time in front of the board. Yay. I'm here um, today, we have the assessor, Tony Homiki, who couldn't attend this meeting. Um, the report uh, he submitted is pretty detailed and self-explanatory, but he wanted me to point out um, the number of property transfers for the last three groundless years. Um, we've seen an increase of about 80% in the number of ownership transfers that uh, were submitted to OBM um, since October 2018 through October 2021. You can see that went from 350 to 630. The other thing that we, uh, that is not in the report that he wanted me to add is that the median sale price for residential properties has increased 26% since October 2018, from a million 250 to a million 575. This was not included in the report. And um, that will be all for, you know, to add and highlight of this report. Um, I'm sure that you have questions. What is usable and non-usable in your transfers? So, 
So usable and non-usable. So a usable cell will be, a transfer will be a property that has been on the market um, for a period of time and then there's a willing buyer and a willing uh, seller. Non-usable will be a family transfer, taxable to non-taxable property, exempt to taxable, things like that, interrelated corporations. Those are non-usable sales. Just for my education, since you mentioned the rise in the transfer volumes and the increasing prices, does the town uh, reassess upon sale? No. We base everything on the last revaluation of 2018. We will look at those sales to see if our data is correct and verify those sales are usable. So we, ca we capture any uh, change in uh, value through the sales in the subsequent revaluation. Correct, which is 2023. Millie, is there a way to get a report to show any tax appeals, not by name, mm -hmm. um, but maybe dollar volume impact, tax revenue impact from appeals that are successful related to flooding issues? Related to flooding issues. Yes. Yeah. Like, do you have people that, homeowners that would come or businesses that would come and say, you know, we're, we flood repeatedly and we'd like a reduction in our taxes? It's very rare we get those. We haven't seen, I could take a look at the last um, year. Uh, it's very rare that we see those, believe it or not. Okay. We haven't seen that much. But I could, there is no other report per se that we can run. Okay. Uh, those will be in the notes that we put in. Okay. We just have, uh, you know, coded based on if they came to the reval or not. Yeah. If there's any information that would be helpful to the Board of Selectmen mm -hmm. and the Board of Finance, that would be help. Great. We'll look into it. Okay. Anything else for Millie? No, thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Thank you all. Yeah. My first. Uh, well done. <laughs> thank you. And, you know, best of luck for everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I don't see Ed Gentile yet. Oh, there. Wow. I say his name in <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Yes. There Just we go. Just in time. Well, Corey, you're ready. Right. <laughs> Somebody rub the lamp. Okay, you're up, Ed. One th uh, two things, I'm sorry. Um, under the tree removal portion of the town, um, the attorney is currently working with uh, Pura to set up our mediation date for those uh, trees that we had posted um, that made uh, uh, public uh, newspapers. Um, and secondly, on a sidewalk repair, we just finished Sedgwick, so we're actually doing quite a bit of sidewalk work lately, so we're, we're wrapping them up before the winter uh, hits us. So I'm here to answer any questions you folks may have. Sidewalks, yay! Thank you very much for all your work. Um, quick question on the stairs: Do you have a completion date? I didn't. I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I would never. I would never Apologies think that. Apologies if I. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, pop a bee's nest here. It's, but no, it's not. It's not. It's a. It's a. There's been a thorn in my side. I'm um, sure. Getting material, getting them scheduled. They are supposed to be here Thursday of this week to start installing them. Fantastic. I will keep my fingers crossed. I have never made a uh, commitment to this board that I couldn't keep, so I, I'm hoping they show up. Um, if not, we will press them to get them here as soon as possible. Thank you. Yes? A yeah. um, couple of questions. Swap shop. Can we get it open on Saturdays? Um, I, I would just, echo that. People are asking, yeah. Yeah, I just spoke to Dan Dalsetti about that. Um, he's having trouble getting volunteers to come in on Saturdays, along with the other complications that go with Saturdays. Um, I proposed to him maybe we start um, start off slow, maybe we do it once or twice a month to see if we can get back into a better swing, see if we can do better with the traffic, managing the, the people that are there. Um, I'm going to bring that up with our advisory committee um, for sustainability. They handle that with me, and Dan is on that committee to see if we can kind of see if we can prompt some more volunteers to come and want to work Saturdays. That's a hard day. People just, because it's so busy. Yeah. And things there's so many things going on. Uh, he is the volunteers have fallen off from that day, and they do it during the week now, and, and instead of the weekends. So it's not a COVID thing. It's a it, it's not. It's okay. it's manpower right now. Okay. A couple of others. The the cage that you came up with on West Avenue. 
good with Algorand. Are you going to do that anywhere else? There's a couple other spots that we're looking at doing that right now, but that one seemed to be our biggest problem um, over a couple years. We did have something there. We just made it and modified it a little bit bigger, a little bit better um, for that use. Okay, on the sewer thing, you have a future potential change to the ordinance that would, and you um, that sentence is, um, ends there. What are you thinking on the ordinance for sewer? Um, for the, it was for the sump pumps? It's for the, yeah. And it's, it's trying to enforce the ordinance that is currently in place mm -hmm. for connecting to our sanitary sewers with your sump pumps and the plumbing code that's in place right now in the state of Connecticut. So enforcement and the, the possibility of any penalties if you can't get it disconnected or won't disconnect it. Or you disconnect it and we come back and find later that you reconnect it. I think those are situations we're looking at. And we'll look at other towns to see what they're doing also. Okay. My last question is, um, I'm, I'm concerned about the drop off and the recycling. Both the compost, I, I don't know, if that's not good, but the recycling, we were, on a trend where we were recycling more than MSW, mm -hmm. and now we've kind of changed that. What, what's what's um, what's going on there? I wish I could tell you why the recycling is down. I could tell you why the MSW is up. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of people that are at home right now, and more children than not are home also. Where that recycle that those numbers never used to hit our transfer station. They went through the board of ed facility. Those type of things. Um, a lot of people working from home still. I'm interested to see what happens in the next two months. October, November, not so much around the holidays because that kind of fluctuates. People go away. That's not a good indicator for me. Um, but I'm interested to see what happens October and November to see if the recycling can, can get up a little bit. And then MSW to go down. A couple questions. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Kip. Um, two questions. One, the uh, people approached me the other day. The train stations are locked. Yes. Is that Condot or is that us? That is us right now. And the reason for that? We are looking to uh, work out a plan to reinstitute opening them and closing them at the proper time and maintaining them. So, so that's that's a discussion issue? I'm having with the town administrator right now. It's a COVID issue? It was when we closed it. Yeah. And making sure, but our vendor used to handle the opening and closing right. of it. Right. Um, we currently do not have a vendor right there. That's correct. We so we're looking to fill that gap somehow and making sure the facility is manned maintained and, and properly uh, enforce um, the use of it. And with regard to the dairy and railroad station platform and elevator project, um, it's moving forward. The original plan had about 33% of the cost being soft costs. Have they come back with a different estimate? We have a meeting in two weeks virtually with them to review the 90%. I'll get a better idea on the soft costs at that time. They'll have an estimate of some kind for me to look at. Um, I know they were reviewing that part of it because it was a question that came up last time. Yeah, so I comfortably high. Yes, it was. But I think that's their um, original estimates or, or co the cost estimates and the way they do their work. It's almost like a fill in the blank, 30% soft cost or 20% contingency. Those are just written in as they figure theirs. As they get down to the, um, the vetting of the project and uh, bidding the project, I believe those estimates are tightened up just a little bit but they err on the side of the higher number, um, especially around the railroad and the stations there when they do their work. To give an example, the soft cost for the construction of the Oxford School is about 5%. Hmm. <laughs> Just to give you a why I'm asking the question. Yeah. I understand they had a really good building committee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, uh, I really good Very head. capable <laughs> leadership, yes. Yeah. Okay, and two questions and then a comment for you. Could you add into your uh, report New sidewalks. You know, we have maintenance. We have, a, a, you know, repairs. New sidewalks, and then can you tell me um, your your next area of focus for new sidewalk? Edgerton. We were that that was the first one I have. I am trying to line that one when I do um, West Avenue also at the same time. Okay. But yep. that is a process we have to go through yep. with the neighbors right now. Uh, that's the first one. I am trying to get a piece of Heights Road done right um, adjacent to uh, the depot. Oh, yeah. Okay. To, fin to fill that gap. Um, yep. That's going to need some, some funding for that, but that's, that's the next one I want to look at too. I know we have Mansfield on the list. Yep. Um, the DOT has not been uh, as cooperative as we all hope they would be when we do work on their state roads. Um, 
So trying to get them to come out there and look at it has been difficult in okay. the last couple of months. Okay. I think it would just be helpful to sort of keep that as a running report in your quarterly so people know that we've got stuff on the, on the table. Okay. Um, can you update us on the uh, Neuroton Heights train station drainage project? Um, sure. I, we are still um, waiting to hear back from the DOT. Uh, as I saw from the emails yesterday, I, I had sent Craig something to remind him. You had sent Craig Fortier something to remind him. He is the, uh, the chief engineer for the DOT rails that we deal with at those facilities. Um, I am patiently, as much as I can be, uh, waiting to hear back from him. So um, it, it'll be more often now that I, I continue to ask him uh, how we can move this thing forward. He did ask that we set up a meeting to review it with his departments. Great. And I think that's the next step. I told him I was open to that. If he could give me some dates, just, I said, just please don't do it in October. I, I have so much going on right now with the, with Darian's problems and the flooding and everything else. Just let me get to November 1st. Anytime after that, I would clear my schedule and meet with him and his group to, to push this forward. Okay, terrific. For, for those of us that might not know the detail, just roughly, what the, does that project entail? We have gotten a, what they call a circuit grant, and it has to do with um, uh, using um, your property to uh, handle your own runoff from your uh, from your parking lots, from your roofs, and, and so on. Well, that is almost two and a half, three acres of asphalt over there. So the design was to put four by four galleries um, under the parking lot on DOT property, capture that water, put it into these galleries, infiltrate it into the ground, and then whatever would overflow tie into the pipe that goes underneath the railroad tracks, I-95, and head towards Maple. That was the idea. Instead of that water now, where it's going down into Heights Road drainage system, right. and backing that all up into that flood and, uh, and flooding that area, right. we took that water away and was hopes that we could infiltrate it into the ground or dump it directly into the pipe. Just don't feed it back into the area that, that has the problem. And the four by fours are in the uh, uh, daily pay parking lot on the side uh, by the depot, or the that's correct. Yeah. There's um, 450 units of them. I think that it's almost a thousand feet long. Yeah, I didn't rows, know, I double didn't. rows of them. So but when you said when you said three acres, I, I didn't. Yeah. Just optically, that doesn't look like three acres. So kind of big. If you want to go big picture, the response to the flooding in Heights Road, um, there were three discrete projects that were associated with you know what to do to try and address that. Federal Realty's million gallon detention basin. This project that Ed has outlined that we're actually doing on behalf of the DOT, in my opinion, it's their property. Right. You know, we got the grant and ready to go. Um, two years, now we've been talking with DOT for their approval. Um, and then a drainage project that was done in the employee parking lot at Palmer's. Right. That's on the Edgerton side of the building that has already been completed. So those three projects were all intended to sort of work in concert with one another to address the Neroton Heights flooding issue. Would you yep. agree with that Absolutely. characterization? Though Federal was the, the big, big picture one, right. um, the other two smaller units um, do, do what they're supposed to do and handle a storm of, you know, 25 year storm event right. in, in ground, in situ. So it doesn't end up out in the uh, high road. Yeah. That's the idea. Yeah. And they're 25 or 50 year? 25 year storm? I think they did a 25 year holding storm, which is the volume for a 25 year event. The infiltration will allow us to get closer to the 50-year storm event, um, and I would have to check the numbers to see how it overflows. Um, which also reminds me, I'm happy that you and Jeremy, and hopefully maybe Mark and Wayne Fox can join us on the 25th for a continued discussion about flooding. Can you be prepared to talk to us about drainage infrastructure um, and the various storm levels that they are constructed to, the standards, in other words, both local and state? I, I can definitely talk to the standards. Great. Um, some of the areas, uh, a couple of the areas we're proposing to look at mm -hmm. um, to see what they are actually functioning at, yep. not what they were designed for because we don't have that information. Got it. I think that's important based on the magnitude of uh, the flooding in those areas. Okay. Uh, we've we selected a couple locations. We have a couple on the, the waiting list too because we're, we're doing actually physical inspections on the system yep. to make sure that they're actually working properly or there's no clogs, there's no broken pipes, things like that, to 
make sure that's not the original problem. Yeah. Well, we look forward to that very important discussion. And I have one last comment. You have to make me a promise that you will continue the sustained efforts to try and get a Roten Heights train station mm -hmm. redevelopment mm -hmm. to move forward. I, I will continue to push that forward. Awesome. Save you a, a pair of scissors to cut <laughs> the ribbon. Super. Any other questions for Ed? Thank you for all okay. the uh, It sounds like you have, yeah, one, one, one last one. Um, but it sounds like you guys already have good relationships with the DOT. Uh, I'm assuming that there is nothing else we can do, no additional resources, no other thing to try to sort of be the bee in the bonnet, if you will, to get a response out of DOT. I've seen that approach by other town engineers and public works directors. It usually doesn't go well with them. I have known a quite a, you know these gentlemen for quite a long time and have a relationship with them that that works well for us. Um, participating in their projects, showing up and at their meetings, um, that they appreciate input, solid input and assistance. Like to even if it's a lay down space, construction area when they're doing their work, especially with areas that we control and maintain. Um, I, I know that's gone a long way in, in keeping our relationship going in the positive direction. Um, and, I, and I like nothing more to have them come back after this meeting and go, all right, there's a couple small changes, but we, we think this is an appropriate plan. I just thought there was something else holding it up. So yeah. after this meeting, I'll have a better idea of, of where that's going. And I, I think David had just a couple questions. I want to hit them really quick. The road in West Avenue construction in the spring, uh, they were going to be bidding this out in the next couple weeks. We're getting the new rates. We got the approval from the state to bid it. Um, I said springtime, I'd like to start as soon as it gets warm. Gotcha. So that could be March, that could be April. I know I'm going to have some issues with traffic. I'm going to make sure I address those properly. But uh, if I wait till the summertime again, um, I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm, I think I'm going to be pushing the limit on it. I want to start as soon as possible and get that going. And uh, Ledge Road at Nerodin, the lots of project there, we are working on, with the DOT, but they put us on hold until they finalize the lease with Jake's building there, and I still think they're working on that. Um, that's been a little bit more difficult than I think they thought it was going to be with the owner of that property. Uh, Edgerton property was the last one you had, Dave. Um, the current status right now, I, I had to put that on hold while I worked on the, the stuff that I'm working on now. Um, I thought it was a little bit more of a priority with the flooding, making sure that we address. I've been meeting with the neighbors. I've been spending time doing that. I thought that was important to do that now. I can say on Edgerton, I really appreciate the full mulling. It look, you know, I got pictures. It looks really great. So we're up there a little more often now, taking that down. Yeah. Um, last question for me: the uh, the sidewalk for safety from the upper to lower lot, the Neroten Heights commuter lot mm -hmm. update. Just a timing. Update. Um, Darren is working on the layout right now. Okay. That's another plan that has to go to. Um, the DOT Rails folks right. and Craig Bordier. Um, it's that one won't involve as much other than telling them I'm going to put a sidewalk where there's grass okay. and some crossovers. And hopefully, um, he'll be able to give me a, a, an approval before you know two years, um, <laughs> so that I can at least get that started in the springtime. Great. Okay. Anything else for Ed? Thank you. No, thank you. We'll look forward to seeing you on the 25th. I'll be there. Okay. Okay, I think that ends our department heads meeting. Thank you everyone for being here. And I'm gonna take a two minute break before we convene for Board of Select. All right, I'd like to call this uh, regular meeting of the Board of Selectmen for Tuesday, October 19th to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, first Selectman's report. I will try to not be redundant from what we heard this morning. Um, you got a COVID update, general COVID update from David this morning. Our weekly positivity rate is 0 0.37, which is awesome. And to just uh, sort of compare the town of Darien, our 90.46% fully vaccinated compares to 66% statewide. So we are doing very well. And we have almost 98% of our eligible population has at least one dose of the vaccine. 
Um, we've had no hospitalizations since March, which is really good. Um, I want to make an important note here. Um, I won't be here for this, um, and I'm a bit sad about it, but um, there needs to be a COVID-19 after action report done. You know, we're not done with the pandemic yet, but it's going to be super important that, that we as a community uh, assess our response to the COVID-19 pandemic and build into future emergency management plans the things that we've learned. So I've spoken to Kate about that, um, speaking to Kevin Cunningham and our, and our other staff internal. So that will be a really important process whenever the pandemic ends for us to undertake heard about us being heart safe that's awesome um, a little bit more on flooding and drainage um, you heard from mark that fema was here twice uh, last friday for the second time um, re reviewing uh, some of those 200 uh, damage assessment claims um, i want to share what i've learned about the disaster declarations um, after tropical storm ida um, affected new jersey new york and connecticut on September 1st and 2nd, New York, including adjacent neighboring counties of Westchester, Suffolk, and Nor Nassau counties in New York, and Bergen and Hudson counties in New Jersey, received their disaster declarations on September 2nd for public assistance and on September 22nd for individual assistance. Fairfield County was included in the New York Declaration, but only for economic injury for businesses. So that means that small businesses have access to uh, what, what they, I'm going to say what they used to call low interest loans. I also think homeowners are eligible for some low, in, low interest loans, but I looked at the loan rates this morning and they're uh, over 3% and over 5%, so you probably could do better by going to your bank, quite frankly. Um, as you heard, Mark continues to work with homeowners. Um, we really need to find a way to um, move forward those ap the homeowner applications. We, we have to get those in. We have to package them up and get them to FEMA. Um, I've been in pretty regular communication with Congressman Himes on the disparity of these declarations between New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut and why we are lagging. Um, last Thursday, he helped facilitate a meeting with the commissioner and staff of uh, Demis to update town leaders in southwestern Connecticut. Demis acknowledged that FEMA is working to document enough damage to allow Governor Lamont to request a declaration. This has not happened yet in spite of rumors that it had. Um, I learned something new on that call. FEMA considers taxable resources of a state in their decision making on disaster declarations. Um, I'm not sure why that is, because as far as I know, there are no other state resources that would be available to homeowners and businesses other than SBA loans, um, so I'm not sure why that is. Um, we eagerly await the state's decision on whether a disaster declaration will be forthcoming. Early and accurate damage assessments in all affected towns is the key factor, apparently, to getting a timely disaster declaration. So you heard me ask Mark this morning about that process. You know, yes, we make it, we make it easy for people to um, digitally contact us, but I almost feel like we're, in, we're kind of in an Eversource place with that. Eversource, you don't have smart meters in your home, so when your power goes out, they don't know that your power's out unless you call them. Um, you know, your, your equipment doesn't feed back to Eversource. So, in my opinion, if you've got one person on Cherry Street who got flooded, maybe we should make an assumption that other people on Cherry Street, for example, got flooded, and we should do kind of that old-fashioned, you know, door-to-door -door or personal outreach so that we can get early and accurate damage assessments. Um, Kate and I have been working on what we can do. How can we raise the bar on our response for flooding? And so we have met with the Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation, otherwise called CIRCA. You heard about a CIRCA grant that, that we got for uh, Neuroten Heights drainage. And Dewberry Incorporated. Dewberry is a national planning and design firm with expertise in environment, engineering, and risk and resilience planning, among other specialties. Circa and Dewberry work very closely together. 
we are we should be receiving any day now a proposal for uh, contract services to assist us in the planning and review work for the uh, the stuff that we need to do going forward um, primarily um, infrastructure projects they can do assessments they can review the Malone and McBroom studies they could probably update those studies so uh, you know I think we're um, probably all in agreement that we need to uh, marshal the resources of, of professionals in the industry to help the town of Darien. The other thought that I had, and I haven't spoken to Jeremy yet, but Ed, I'd be curious your thoughts about this. Um, FEMA flood maps are, um, they map to a hundred year flood um, incident. So Elsa was a 200 year storm, parts of Ida were 500 year storms. It might be interesting to see if we could map those so that you know for people that um, they've never flooded before well you you never flooded before because you're not in the hundred year flood zone you're not really aware of that um, but it would be good to know you know who who would be included in a flood zone for a 200 or greater uh, flood situation um, we I shared with you yesterday information from Wayne Fox about storm water authorities and erosion and control boards and their various powers and authorities. Um, w the Board of Selectmen needs to further the, the discussion about that to see which of those, I'm not going to say if, I'm going to say which of those two um, entities can best serve the town of Darien for an ongoing and sustained effort to look at uh, drainage and flood mitigation issues. Um, Jeremy and Ed uh, and Wayne, hopefully he can come, will present to us on the 25th to further that discussion. Um, I think we're at a decision point on the best path forward to create this dedicated board commission or authority uh, for continually addressing the results of what is likely to be uh, changes in climate and severity of storms. Um, on another matter, uh, on the 30th of September, I asked Duke Deneen and Dr. Adley to join me for a conversation with the American Jewish Committee of Westchester and Fairfield. The meeting was to establish a relationship with our town and for the AJC to offer assistance as we continue to work through how best to continue our commitment to combating expressions of intolerance. And that's intolerance in general. Uh, certainly they're concerned with an anti-Semitism, but they recognize that our town is struggling with other issues related to intolerance at this moment. I'm grateful that the town of Darien has the AJC as an ongoing resource. To further our town's commitment to addressing anti-Semitism, I attended virtually the US AJC Mayor's Conference on Anti-Semitism uh, on August 16th. And I also signed the Mayor's United Against Anti-Semitism Pledge along with 44 of my Connecticut colleagues. I encourage the next First Selectman and Board of Selectmen to continue these efforts. Uh, we heard that Wayne Fox is working to coordinate a uh, mediation session with Pura on the, uh, the tree warden hearing outcome. Scheduling is underway for uh, organizational meetings for the IT steering committee. The ARPA Steering Committee will meet on Monday at 9.45 for their uh, organizing meeting. And Kate's going to uh, spearhead the IT Steering Committee um, uh, organizational meeting. Uh, relating to ARPA, just a heads up, CCM issued a public statement yesterday supporting the idea that monies local governments received as part of a county apportionment should be used for regional recovery projects and for towns, regions, and the state to work together on projects. The county apportionment for Darien is approximately $4 million of the $6.2 million that we've received from the ARPA uh, grant. So I I'm not exactly sure what that means. I don't know if there's going to be a direct ask for the region to uh, ask the town of Darien and all other towns to to give the region money or if they will put forward projects that we should consider participating in but I think that we need to get answers on that as we begin the discussions on ways to um, 
potentially spend the six million, we might not have six million to spend if there's if there's um, more than a suggestion, if it's uh, more of a mandate. Um, our harbor master, Tom Bell, will be retiring after 11 years of dedicated service to our town. I want to thank Tom for his many years uh, working on our, our waters and ask for any interested parties to contact my office if you're interested in being considered by the Board of Selectmen to serve as our next harbor master. I have one uh, party who's interested already, already, but certainly we would love to interview others. And I've reached out to um, Duke Deneen and Dr. Adley and Kip to further the process of finding volunteers for the Elementary School Building Committee, hoping there might be um, a few people, Kip, from your building committee that might, that might love <coughs> serving on building committees and want to continue their service for a few more years to the town in that capacity. Um, but certainly, if there are other people in town, we will, we will be opening up a solicitation um, as we consider people with various specific expertise to round out that committee. That's it for me. Kate? Um, as Jen said in her report, we are prepping for the budget for next year. Um, we have one union contract open. We just, yesterday, um, I think we have wrapped up some of the leftovers from the Public Works Union, mainly around um, service ratings. Uh, and then we We'll be diving into the police contract in a couple months. Um, we're also prepping for a new administration. There'll be things that have to um, <clears throat> change when the first election changes. This week, you should see the landscaping beginning at Highland Farms uh, around the parking lots. We are looking at new parking software, parking permit software. Um, we are, well, they are reviewing town hall security. Um, we did put in security cameras. You can see them in the hallway, but um, Ed and Tony are going to be getting back to me by the end of the month on a report from the police on security upgrades. Um, and Jen and I are reviewing the guidelines, the regulations for the ARPA grant. Um, <clears throat> things do change. The FAQs, um, there have been, I think, like six updates. So we're going through them, reviewing them so that we can give the best guidance um, to the committee. A lot of people want um, money. Some may be eligible under the guidelines. Some may not. Some may be a stretch. Um, but we're trying to put the committee in the best position possible to um, make their decisions. That's it. Just to tag along to that, CCM has a dedicated uh, individual who is available to assist cities and towns with any questions that yes. we have about things that that we you know are, are eligible and with our reporting requirements. Right, and he's already been very helpful to us, and um, we're also fortunate that both Jen and I are um, familiar with the National GFOA's expert on the um, on the app too. So it's great that I have two great people I can reach out to with questions on. Um, interpreting the regulations and the guidelines. Super. Okay, thank you. Um, board liaison reports, and as part of this, Sarah, if you wouldn't mind maybe updating on the... I think that's what you're going to... Yes, no. oh, great. Um, and so I have actually two quick updates. I serve as a representative to the Driving Youth Task Force, and tomorrow night at 7 p.m. at the middle school, they'll be presenting the results of this year's survey. So please attend. Um, secondly, we um, started a few months ago, maybe June-ish, maybe early June, um, action to from the Think Smart Before You Start pedestrian safety campaign. We've been working um, very well with Noble House Media, but um, more importantly with the police commission and the police department, and we've gratefully funded this for us. But um, we're looking to keep our roads safe for all the individuals that use it, whether they're on a bike or they're walking or they're in their car. Um, as Chief said, distracted driving is definitely a problem, but we all have to make sure that um, we're you know, using the road safely and, and taking care of each other. So we're looking forward to having that roll out soon, hopefully, um, but it is exciting. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you, and I want to thank the Police Association uh, for yes, their contribution you. to fund the campaign. So um, anybody else liaison, of course, David, nothing for Blight, okay? Not on Wednesday. Okay, great. And Kip? I'll have a full report next, uh, next board meeting, which is Monday. Okay. Terrific. Look forward to that. All right, thank you. 
Um, so uh, at this point, I would like to uh, ask for a motion to amend the agenda to add a discussion for any board members that want to make comments um, about flooding in town. Um, and, and those comments will then hopefully um, help inform our discussion on the 25th. So motion to amend the agenda for a discussion. So moved. Kit moves, Monica seconds. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. So yes, today. You, Net, you're not going, you don't want to have a discussion today. We got a bunch of new information late last night uh, uh, regarding the water authorities and we're going to have presentations from the experts uh, uh, coming up uh, in, the, in the following meeting. And uh, it, we just heard uh, for TV 79, if a uh, resident wanted to search for flooding in the Board of Selectmen meetings, he wouldn't find it on the agenda that's going to be posted for this meeting. So uh, I would rather push it so that it be uh, at the uh, post the presentations at the subsequent meeting uh, and make it a fulsome discussion, uh, including the most updated information uh, that we have. Uh, so it can be a priority and the main focus of the meeting rather than have it be uh, an uh, amended meeting item. Okay, so we asked the town clerk about this item. We were prepared to send out an amended agenda. She preferred that we amend the agenda at today's meeting. So thank you for your comments on that. Um, we, I believe that you voted to amend the agenda. Is that correct? I, yes, I was going to vote. I. However, I understand that, and I can appreciate that, and I and it makes sense to me to have it all in one meeting. So, it is an interesting thought. Um, so, it, uh, we will have a robust discussion, but I, we have three yeses, and I'll wait for your vote. Well, yeah, I'm deciding vote. Um, <laughs> Not really. I mean, we have a majority to have, you know, to open no, up. No, I understand. Discussion. I I do think it does make sense to have it in one discussion. So, um, okay. So thank you. Okay, so um, that's a three to two vote on amending the agenda, so the motion carries. So I will open discussion and it can, Kate. You need two thirds vote to amend the agenda and two thirds okay. of five is actually a little bit over three. Okay, all right, so um, in the absence of, I mean, crazy that we, anyway, um, what I would like to ask as a substitute that if you have specific questions that we could have addressed this morning to give to our staff to help inform our meeting on the 25th, that you please draft your questions, circulate them to everyone on the Board of Selectmen so that in well enough in advance of the 25th so that we can get all of your questions answered. Is that fair enough? Yeah. Okay, great. We'll move on to new business. Um, this. We may or may not need to take action here. I just want to make sure that we are all comfortable with the size of the ARPA committee. Um, we're hopefully going to be taking an action in a few moments to appoint the chamber's designee to the ARPA committee. Um, and I just want to give everybody a, a last chance to make a determination on if you are satisfied with the representation on the committee. You mentioned this morning the possibility of maybe having someone from human services. I thought that was... She's ex officio. Oh, is she? Okay. Yeah. That's good. That, I like that, yeah. Okay. Jamie, Monica. We have one person from Chamber of Commerce. Yes. Okay. Yes. Would it make sense to... Um, is that person, are we Are we sure they're, they will be able to attend? And would it make sense to have a backup for that? Um, well, I guess we have to wait and see to, you know, once we convene meetings to see who all can participate. But um, maybe we could move forward in this way, Kate, um, advise me. If we find that we need additional representation, the next Board of Selectmen can always amend the committee, Absolutely. correct? Yeah. Okay. I just want to leave room for that because um, I, I think outreach to the nonprofit sector is going to be very important. and and. Hopefully we could get at that through Allie and through the members of the committee. Um, but I just want to double check because it's a really important effort that we're about to kick off. Would you be interested in having some of those nonprofits maybe attend some of the meetings? That's, that's an interesting point. I know that you're mm -hmm. adding us up. I think we have some phenomenal ones in town, like first and first. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. Their voices will be important um, as part of the due diligence process. Awesome. 
Okay, so um, hearing hearing no no desire at this moment in time to amend the committee, uh, we will move on to our transfers. Uh, discuss and take action on a request to transfer $25,509 to the Town Hall Heating System Upgrade. And I believe we have our heating system experts in the room today. <laughs> Hello, Ed and Tony. Good morning. I did bring uh, Anthony Campanella, our facility supervisor, <coughs> with me today in case there were some heavy technical questions that we needed to answer. Um, but uh, what you do have in front of you is a transfer request for funds to complete our HVAC work here in this building. The uh, air conditioning part was completed last year. It's 100% completed up and running. The heating portion of that project, uh, we did come across additional valves <coughs> and uh, actuators and motors uh, that were hidden either in the ceilings or in the walls or where we found, we we're supposed to find one, we found two or three. So um, we had our consultant give us an estimate for the additional work. He had bid them on a per unit price for the valves. Um, so uh, we got that quote back and what you see in front of you is the request to finish the project now uh, with the additional uh, work that we had found. And I'll answer any questions that you have. Any questions for Ed or Anthony? How is the zone working so far? The air conditioning seems better this summer. Can ask the, the residents, so to speak, of this building. Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I usually don't complain about the air conditioning. It's you know, it's when we get to the heating that I send the messages Got it. from the nook of the north. And like that, you know. Everyone has a different temperature level that they enjoy working at. Of course. Um, of course. It's, it's been a challenge in the past. It, it won't be as much of a challenge, wait, wait, but as always, there, there's going to be some times, like right now, um, if I come in here on a, uh, on a Thursday or Friday, these blinds will be open. Yeah. This room will be about five, six degrees hotter of course. because of that. And it's just those things that we have to work on. Um, sides of the buildings are important. Kate's side planning and zoning right now is probably really cool, but in the afternoon it'll warm up. Jamie's office in the morning gets the heat um, from 7 o'clock till about 1 o'clock in the afternoon and then it starts to die down again. So these are things Tony and I both know. Dave Sabini's also been really good too keeping this facility, but it's, it's an older building so it, it challenges us to, to check it every day and make sure it's functioning properly and adjusting the heat. And I have it right on my computer so uh, if Nanook calls, I uh, give her some heat down and, and, and Kate just lets me know when everything is working and, and properly functioning again. Love it. So. So yeah, I can throw out these big spending ideas since I won't be on the board of selectmen anymore. <laughs> but nice. um, there's a lot you can do with thermal window shades. And it might be worth considering upgrading some window shades in key areas of town hall um, to address those issues. I'm not going to suggest replacing all the windows, which would probably be ideal. Um, but um, I throw that out as an idea. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other yeah. any other questions? Yes. Can How many zones have you ended up with? Heating zones. We we started off with thirty one. I think this building. That's just in these two floors. We have the gymnasium, room one nineteen area, the Darien Arts Center area. That's where we found more of the valves than we thought were were in there. Yeah. Um, because of the age of that building and the conversion from. Um, what used to be a gymnasium cafeteria area to what it is now, which is a dance studio. So 31 zones. The, generally speaking, there's probably closer to 40 right now. And you're, are you going to end up with that many? Yes, we haven't changed the zones. Oh, okay. Um, Just the, the VAVs are still in place. They're still going to monitor the rooms. Okay. Um, Just no more, no more air, air power. No, not pneumatic anymore. It's no all pneumatic. mechanical. So when you when you find the surprise valves and things like that, I assume that the way the system is designed, you have to just replace each individual valve where it lies, right? There's no consolidation it, it opportunities is, to. It is um, because of the way the piping and the steam system works. It, it's better just to replace in its location and not to change it. Um, it doesn't mean that later in life, when we, we see some opportunities to make the savings, that we could, but it, we could make the change. But it would cause us to do some repiping. So you have to balance that cost. And generally speaking, steam systems, you really don't want to mess around with them. 
Yeah, once, that's you, much. once you open it up, you don't know what's going to happen. That's right. correct. Exactly. Right. And when would you would we be able to get this finished? Um, they are waiting on the approval for the transfer. I have all the material ready to go. The contractor ready to go. He's just it, he's okay. sitting ready. I told him not to go anywhere because <laughs> I had a meeting today, and the board of finances tonight. So with the hopes okay. that we got approval tonight, I, we can start. Uh, Pestering and cut back here and finish up, but I do need to turn the boilers on soon. So, and he's yeah. aware of that. Yeah. Okay. So bought the stuff. Yeah, we have ready to go. If there are no other questions, I'll entertain a motion to transfer twenty-five thousand five hundred nine dollars from Board of Finance Reserve to upgrade the town hall heating. Sarah moves, seconded by Monica. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next transfer is. Let me check this off your list. I'm going to move back into it. Consider a transfer of $82,741 from insurance recoveries from Tropical Storm Elsa uh, to the Board of Finance Reserve. Uh, you received the. Explanation of this transfer relates to the loss of three Board of Education vehicles. Questions for Kate on this transfer? Um, I'll ask a question. Mm -hmm. um, have you heard if there are any other plans to put in place to help mitigate future vehicle loss at the town garage? Um, <coughs> yes. There, um, I don't know about the board of ed, um, but um, with the town vehicles, um, ed is looking at um, <clears throat> creating another driveway out the back where they can easily move town vehicles <clears throat> up to a higher elevation in the back of the building as opposed to the front. Okay. Because there, there's a limited space in the front. So if we see something, you know, along the lines of Ida. Um, we'd be able to move some of the vehicles to an even higher location. I would assume that the Board of Ed will have the same access, but um, they're responsible for moving their own vehicles. Yeah, um, I've thought about that, and, and I know that um, that takes personnel to be able to you know be on site to try and move the vehicles out of mm -hmm. flood water. Mm -hmm. so, um, I'll talk to Ed. I just wonder if there's some kind of collaboration where, you know, extra keys are available somewhere in the building where, you know, yeah. who's ever there Couldn't can help save yeah. the truck. That would be a good idea. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions on this transfer? Um, then I will entertain a motion to approve the transfer of $82,741. Monica moves. Kip seconds. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, we have one appointment, and that is to appoint Bill Jensen, uh, uh, proprietor of the Darien Toy Box, to our ARPA steering committee. He was a recommendation by the Darien Chamber of Commerce. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Thank you, Kip. I have a second. Thank you, Monica. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. We have regular meeting minutes uh, of September 27th. Any corrections or additions? No? A motion to approve? Second. Sarah moves. David seconds. All those in favor, say aye, please. Aye. 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 And then we have special meeting minutes of September 27th. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sarah moves those. <laughs> Sarah moves those. <laughs> David seconds those. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Great. Okay. Kate, are there any public comments for today? Not that I've seen. Okay. Uh, agenda review. I'm assuming folks want to maybe hold on new agenda items for the yes. board of selectmen. Okay. Um, motion to adjourn. Monica moves. I have a second. Sarah seconds. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you all very much. <laughs>